Yeah, it's a great pleasure to have uh, in the 24th QASTM seminar series. Uh, today's speaker is Professor BJ Bala Shubramanian. He's from uh, Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of Pennsylvania. And uh, a lot of people know what BJ, BJ do uh, these days and uh, why, uh, like uh, in which branches he works. But for students, those who don't know him, for uh, them, I just want to uh, speak a few words. Like he's working in the area of quantum field theories, string theory, uh, also machine learning, statistical inference, and uh, most interestingly, application of physics in biological sciences, uh, particularly theoretical neuroscience and those problems. And, uh, uh, for his uh, study, I just want to mean that, uh, I just want to point that he did his PhD from Princeton University, master's from MIT, and uh, then he was associated with the Harvard University, and uh, then he joined uh, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, uh, Pennsylvania State University in uh, which year? Uh, 2000, I think. 2000, yeah. Yeah, so today he is going to speak about a very interesting and fascinating topic. Uh, at in the present day, it is obviously people are uh, doing research on that in different perspectives. So he is going to talk about the black hole information puzzle and uh, uh, many more uh, physics and its impacts uh, 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 in, in the theoretical physics. So please, Vijay, you can uh, start, and um, and it's a great pleasure to have you in the twenty fourth series. And uh, yeah, now it's your time. Well, thanks very much for inviting me, Sayantan. Uh, pleasure to be giving this talk. So um, indeed, today I will talk about the black hole information puzzle. Um, feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions, and we'll take it from there. Now, Sayantan told me that I should be thinking about this seminar as directed towards graduate students, uh, master's students, and PhD students, and but that there would also be postdocs and um, faculty involved. So that's a complicated kind of talk to give. So the way I've structured this is in the beginning part of the talk, I'm going to try to go over the uh, sort of uh, the conceptual basis and history, if you like, of the black hole information puzzle, because this is an question that people have been thinking about for decades and there have been many approaches to solving and thinking about it. So I'll start with that and then in the latter half of the talk I will focus mostly <clears throat> on new ideas. This is a very hot topic right now. So new ideas that have come about in the last year or so. So this will be a two-part talk. There's also been um, uh, you know, uh, work on this topic done by very many people over the years and I was trying to scratch my head as to how I would get through such a talk in the time allotted, well, since it's not a sequence of summer school lectures. So basically, I'm going to give the talk focused through the lens of the work uh, myself and my collaborators have done on this subject. So that necessarily means that I'll be leaving out work done by many other people. That's wonderful. But I'm just going to say this in advance and try to fit this within the time constraints. Great. So let's begin. So this talk is going to be about the black hole information puzzle. So let's start um, at the beginning, which is to say, whoops, why is, ah, there we go. Which is to say, by asking the question, what is the black hole information puzzle? So, all right, so, <clears throat> so the, uh, the problem or puzzle that we seek to solve goes all the way back to the early 1970s when Beckenstein, Bardeen, Carter, Hawking revealed a formal analogy between the laws of black hole mechanics and thermodynamics. So this is how it goes. So uh, if you consider a black hole of mass M and consider changing its mass, then the <clears throat> change in its mass is proportional to the change in its surface area with the proportionality constant just kappa, the surface gravity. It's also true that at least in any uh, classical process, the area of a black hole can never decrease and that this surface gravity is constant at the horizon. So Beckenstein, Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking already observed in 1973, a very long time ago, 
But these laws of black hole mechanics are in formal analogy with the laws of thermodynamics, namely delta T equals T delta S, the entropy is not decreasing and temperature is constant equilibrium. But you know, interestingly, if you go look at the original papers, uh, there's a line in one of them that says, <clears throat> but you should just simply take this as a formal analogy, not as a real thing, because if it were a real thing, you know, black holes would radiate and everybody knows they don't. What do you know, a couple of years later, um, uh, uh, Hawking derives Hawking radiation and shows that the temperature of a black hole is the surface gravity kappa, so then the analogy is complete. Now, how does Hawking radiation happen? Well, there are many ways of thinking about the process. So one way that will be pertinent to much of what we have to say today is that just as outside the horizon, you have some pair production process. One quantum goes in, another quantum escapes to infinity. And, you know, because of the uh, funny business with, you know, the way time points and what's positive and negative, you know, the thing falling in, in effect, has negative mass relative to infinity and the thing going out has positive mass. So in effect, you extract energy from the black hole. But notice that you have uh, now put in a quantum and emitted a quantum that were interacting. So effectively, the outgoing quantum has become entangled with the interior. Okay, so that's the setup. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that black holes act like black bodies. And now we get a puzzle. Black holes, um, like the Schwarzschild black hole, is a solution to the vacuum equations of motion. There's nothing there. Right? So here's our puzzle. Well, if there's nothing there, how is this happening? So normally, any time you have a thermodynamics of any kind, we expect that underlying it, there is a statistical physics. So in other words, we're expecting to see somehow here that this empty curve space is the universal effective description of E to the S as being the entropy uh, complex microstates, <clears throat> where S, the entropy, is going to be basically the area divided by 4 G Newton. So a related problem, besides understanding the origin of the entropy, a closely related problem, is unitarity. Because you see, this radiation is strictly thermal, right? And uh, uh, if it's strictly thermal, <clears throat> you know, it clearly knows nothing about the state of the system. And so if you, I don't know, make the black hole with elephants or, or dictionaries or whatever, um, after some time, you have the stream of thermal radiation coming out and eventually the black hole evaporates away. There's nothing there. And so um, you destroyed the information about what went in. But we know that can't happen according to quantum mechanics. And so the black hole information puzzle asks, um, is unitarity preserved by quantum gravity? So this kind of process, do you destroy quantum information or not? Equivalently, you can phrase it as, can you decode what fell into the black hole from the Hawking radiation? <clears throat> now, you might say, well, I don't know, this is some strange thing that concerns, you know, uh, black holes. Black holes are strange things. Anyway, maybe I'm confused. Uh, maybe I'm missing something. But in fact, <clears throat> you can show similar effects in many so, other situations. Yeah, I have a question in the previous slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe very silly question, but that just make a connection with the thermodynamics. Is it kind of an assumption that the this temperature is in equilibrium? Uh, well, uh, yes, sort of. Of course, the temperature is changing um, because it's not entirely in equilibrium because, you know, the black hole radiates and the temperature changes as the mass of the black hole changes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you're making a some sort of quasi-static uh, assumption here. And of course, uh, very close, the black hole is very big, then it's true that the temperature is very stable for long periods of time, slowly changes. That makes good sense. Also, as we will see, if you consider black holes in, in uh, anti sitter space, the black hole comes to equilibrium with its radiation, then it is equilibrium. But here you're thinking in, this, in that kind of language of some kind of quasi-static process, yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, so just in case uh, one feels that this is some kind of oddity of black holes, let's consider another example. Here, let's consider the example of empty space, nothing in it, with a positive cosmological constant. So that's the action, 1 over 16 pi g, and here's the Ricci scalar plus the you know, cosmological constant. And as everybody knows, the vacuum solution to this action is de Sitter space. And de Sitter space, you know, there's many ways of presenting de Sitter space. But during inflationary times, the sitter space basically looks like this. There's a time, and then space expands exponentially. And you know, this is supposed to be actually uh, realistic or real. It's our fate in the future if dark energy actually exists. So if you're living in the sitter space, what does the world look like? Well, if you're an inertial observer, so this blue dot here around you, 
you see what's called a static, the static patch. You see a cosmological horizon around you. And uh, the way this is written is the metric is ds squared equals this expression on the right. By the way, can everybody see my cursor? I can see. Yes. Good, great. And so the, the way the metric looks is there's a one minus r squared over l squared, dt squared, things of this nature. And um, at r equals l, there is, uh, you know, the metric gets singular. That's the cosmological horizon. And you can show by doing, you know, thought experiments involving, you know, observers with different kinds of detectors and so on, that this cosmological horizon acts as if it has an entropy and as if it has a temperature just like black holes do. So once again, this is strange. This was just uh, NT accelerating uh, uh, universe. And so you might ask, how can such a thing have an entropy? There's nothing there. So normally to have an entropy, you might think you need many underlying degrees of freedom. And so you can similarly ask, what does the cosmological radiation say about unitarity of the evolution? So now you could say, well, this is also kind of strange, but well, you know, it's the sitter space, there's a positive cosmological constant, everybody knows that's odd. So you can up the ante still further. So now let's just consider empty flat space, really nothing in it, and there's no black hole either. Uh, <clears throat> What's that? Uh, 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 I had a small question. Yeah. Uh, suppose we have an inertial system. Uh, do oh, we still assume, you uh, can we uh, still, uh, am I audible? Sir? I can't hear you. Uh, uh, your voice, your voice is uh, breaking up a bit. Okay, uh, am I audible now? Sir? Yes, you are. Uh, okay, so suppose we are in uh, some inertial reference frame. Uh -huh. uh, do we still account for entropy in the, say, a box which is the, in inertial reference frame. Uh, suppose there is a box which is stationary with uh, there's just vacuum in the box and uh, do we still account for uh, some kind of entropy if we partition the box into two regions? Uh, the, I'm asking this because uh, what the uh, uh, idea seems to suggest is that in presence of gravity uh, we can account for entropy in empty space. I am just curious to know if uh, it's true when there is a uh, flat, whether it's true even when, even in the absence of gravity. Um, I'm sorry about this, but actually the, uh, the zoom cut out for a minute there. And so let me uh, try to see, can you see my screen still or not? Hello? No. You cannot see my screen. Okay, how about now? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now and I am going to press play again. And I am going to unfortunately have to ask uh, the questioner to ask their question again. I'm sorry, but everything cut out completely for a minute. Hello? Um, Sayantan? I really don't know what happened. <laughs> okay, so I didn't catch that question in, in consequence. So, uh, yeah. Could somebody quickly repeat it? Even I can't be able to heard the full question. It's just part of. Okay, so then maybe uh, since I didn't have... maybe he can if join. I can't able to see him as well. I don't know. Okay, so perhaps what I'll do is I'll continue. Yeah. And uh, when he uh, connects back, perhaps you could ask the question again. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. In that case, I am going to continue for now. Um, and so we are now going to consider a third example, uh, which is just uh, accelerated observers in flat space. So here is uh, you know x and t uh, two dimensions, and here are uh, here are the green lines are family of accelerated observers, and we suppose that the accelerated observers therefore see a um, um, uh, uh, well they will see a horizon, and that's these dashed lines. So this is basically like in Brindle coordinates, right? So as um, uh, Bill Andro showed, 
Accelerated observers of this kind basically see these horizons as obeying the laws of horizon mechanics. That is to say, if you stick in some energy passing through, the horizon will grow and that kind of thing. And furthermore, um, um, uh, uh, an observer, an accelerated observer carrying a, radi uh, carrying a detector sees the acceleration frame analog of Hawking radiation, namely unreal radiation. So basically what this says is that if you assume Einstein's equations of motion, then in accelerated frames of reference, it will appear as if the space-time satisfies certain kinds of laws of thermodynamics. So again, the equations of motion seem to imply certain kinds of equations of state. So interestingly, in 1995, Ted Jacobson reversed this argument. He said, I'm not going to assume the equations of motion of gravity at all. So instead, he said that he would assume that accelerated observers must see the laws of horizon thermodynamics. Okay, And then he derived from that the fact that this system of equations, the system of equations of horizon thermodynamics, he showed that that's equivalent to the uh, system of equations of, um, uh, 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 of equations of motion, Einstein's equations of motion. So in the net, what he basically showed was that what you might call equations of motion, that is to say Einstein's equations, are equivalent in both directions to what you might call equations of state, namely the equations of horizon, uh, of, uh, horizon mechanics. Now, the thing that's very strange about this is that equations of motion are associated in the end to a unitary quantum theory. That's because we take the equation of motion to arise by, you know, Euler-Lagrange variation of some action, let's say. And the way we define quantum mechanics is, you know, you sum over all possible paths, e to the i action. So there's some unitary quantum theory that usually gives rise to the equations of motion in the classical limit. But contrast, equations of state are generally associated to ensembles of theories, namely, or at least ensembles of states. So there's some ensemble involved, right? So basically, um, the way you get an equation of state is by taking a whole bunch of different systems that you don't really know which one the system is in, but you know some macroscopic quantum numbers and you have some distribution over them, and then you compute quantities in that ensemble and you get equations of state. They're fundamentally different things from equations of motion. But if you believe this argument, it appears to indicate that in the case of gravity, the equations of motion, namely Einstein's equations, and the equations of state, namely the horizon dynamics equations, are equivalent. That's really puzzling. And that's also, uh, uh, and that's one of the things that we need to understand if we want to understand the, um, you know, the, the black hole information problem. Um, uh, any questions so far? I have a question. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. So uh, I was asking, like, uh, it's a really elementary question, but like uh, this Jacobson's argument, it gives uh, back the Einstein's equation of motion but there are alternative theories of gravity as well right so what does it say about them uh, what alternative theory of gravity are you thinking of uh, like uh, like i'm not very sure like uh, i haven't done a very thorough study of them so i'm not particularly sure but okay. i'm just so asking I'm not sure it. i'm not sure that i agree that there are necessarily very many alternative theories of gravity there are there are indeed constraints of what makes a consistent theory of gravity but you can imagine things like in you know, higher derivative terms and this, that, and the other. And various of these things modify the thermodynamic. If they modify the thermodynamic relationships in particular ways, then you could ask the question, uh, do they, uh, you know, can you do this equivalence for the modified equation of motion, the modified equation of state? And I believe there's been uh, some work done on things like that. I'm not very familiar with it, but uh, I think at least in the case of higher derivative terms, there has been some work done on that. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, great. So, uh, okay, great, so that's the setup. So that's the problem we want to understand. So over the years, there have been many, many approaches to the information puzzle. So I'd like to spend a little time for the benefit of the students and the, uh, in, the, in the audience, talking a little bit about these approaches, because we did think that we'd made progress on these questions using those different approaches. So the core of the puzzle in the end is whether or not effective field theory applies. I mean by that, that the calculation done by Hawking was in the end an effective field theory calculation. Imagine there's a black hole, and in that black hole you have you know, some quantum field theory that's defined, of course, below some cutoff, 
and you do some calculation of the quantum field theory according to the standard rules of effective field theory, and it says that, well, you get thermal radiation and information seems to be lost. <clears throat> You can dress up this calculation, make it fancier in many ways. You can try to include back reaction. You know, you can do various kinds of tweaks like that. But in the end, you generically get the answer of this uh, uh, sort of thermal radiation and loss of unitarity. Now, of course, you know, one simple out out of the loss of unitarity is the effective field theory calculation. The semi-classical calculations are just wrong, right? There's nothing; they're not correct, and that's why you're getting this answer. But you, but if you try to evaluate these computations by all the standard rules, then they appear to be very good, uh, essentially very accurate, nearly to the end of black hole evaporation. That's essentially because locally, you know, um, near the horizon, for example, there's nothing um, strange, right? I mean, the, 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 uh, uh, the curvatures can be small, you can be well within, you know, uh, uh, well away from the Planck scale, things like this. So it does seem like, you know, locally, the effective field theory calculation seems to be valid according to all the standard rules. That's really the core of the puzzle. What's going on here? It looks like you do this calculation, it's right, and then you get this loss of unitarity. So there have been many, many proposals for new physics that could then explain uh, why this problem arises this puzzle arises and how to get around it. And if you look at this review over here, you'll find many, many of them surveyed. So that's one place to uh, uh, go look for those uh, possible choices. So one idea that was very popular that many people talked about was something called black hole complementarity. And uh, in particular, I myself as a graduate student remember reading papers by Gerard Toft, Saskia, and the Berlin Days describing this idea. So concretely, the idea in black, or, or a concrete version of black hole complementarity is the idea that effective field theory cannot be used to describe both infalling and outgoing observers at the same time. Now, how could this possibly be the case? Well, so really, the way these arguments for uh, complementarity go is they involve the weirdness of black holes. Remember, if you drop in a quantum from the outside, um, you know, it's going to blue shift on the way into the horizon. And if you have a Hawking quantum that's going to climb out from near the horizon and then come out to infinity at late time, then it's going to get heavily redshifted by the gravitational well that's in. So you can think about what that involves and how you define effective field theories as being defined below some energy cutoff. And then you can show, you know, um, in fact, completely explicitly in simplified models of gravity, like one plus one dilaton gravity, you can show explicitly that if you're in a sector where you want to describe both you know, infalling quanta that enter the black hole, as well as the things that are going to redshift to become the black hole radiation, then they're going to have to cross and when they cross, their interactions will be above any defined energy cutoff that you choose to name. So in this sense, you know, you can make, you, it is possible to make arguments that there's something funny about effective field theory, that although it would seem like in the single particle sector, you can consistently define, you know, energies and things below, below the cutoff and in, in all the standard ways and, you know, restrict to the theory below the cutoff, that if you're trying to talk about interactions, especially near the horizon that will lead to Hawking radiation, um, then you have a problem that you can't, uh, you cannot uh, self-consistently do this. So that sense that you could not self-consistently describe the process of Hawking radiation and unitarity in uh, standard semi-classical effective field theory suggests, suggests or suggested until very recently that in order to understand unitarity of Hawking radiation, you absolutely needed control of the microscopic quantum gravity. Basically, you need control of the string scale, of the Planck scale, to understand how unitarity um, uh, developed. So now what I'm going to describe is how that proceeds. Um, and, you know, we've gained many understandings from that point of view. So really, if you want a microscopic quantum gravity, it's going to be in something like string theory. So the idea is that, to, so, so what do you really want to do? So in the end, if you really could, you'd like to track the entire transformation between external matter falling into the black hole to make some sort of microstate and then re-radiating out and then coming back up. So to track this in detail, if that were even possible, you would need a model of microstates. So first of all, you need microstates for black holes. Now, one of the great progresses in string theory was, of course, the discovery that for many black holes, especially, you know, charged and near extremal and extremal black holes in various dimensions, it's possible to explicitly 
given a count of such microstates. So in many cases, the microstates of black holes are basically bound states of D-brains and other solitons and explicitly account for the entropy. And here's an example. So suppose you want to describe the classic five-dimensional charged black holes in string theory, then the way you're supposed to build them microscopically in string theory is you take the 10 dimensions of string theory, you compactify them on a torus, on a T5, and on that torus, you wrap a whole bunch of D5 brains. Then all those, uh, the D5 brains carry one of the charges that the macroscopic black hole is going to have. Then you bind to those five brains a whole bunch of D1 brains. You bind them together. That gives the second charge that you're going to see macroscopically after you've compactified the torus away. And then how do you quantize the system? Well, the way you quantize the system is, you know, in string theory, the quanta of D brains are open strings attached to the D brain. So you have, you know, open strings attached to the five brains. Those are these blue lines. You have open strings attached to the one brains. Those are these brown lines. And then you've got open strings running between the D1 brains and the D5 brains. Those are these uh, green lines. And you're supposed to go ahead and quantize the whole thing. And you'll get a whole bunch of zero modes. And the way you're supposed to count, for example, the entropy of the system is, well, you count how many states there are of the system consistent with the macroscopic charges, which are the mass uh, and the electrical and magnetic charges of the system. So you can do that. And Strominger and Waffa indeed showed that that gives you a precise exact count of the entropy of such black holes. What's more, you know, looking at this from the, somebody who wants to think about the information puzzle, it seems very, very clear that there is no room here for a information paradox or loss of unitarity. At least at weak coupling, when the horizon of the black hole is, let's say, smaller than the string scale. So this is basically a soliton, a bunch of D-brains sitting at some location. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to take some matter, which is some bunch of closed strings. You're going to aim the matter um, at, the, um, at these D-brains, the closed strings are going to come in, they're going to hit the D-brain, turn to open strings, they're going to move around the D-brain for a while, eventually they'll recombine and annihilate and turn to closed strings again, and they'll come out. And that process, well, presumably is Hawking radiation, in some cases you can even compute that it will look thermal, that's unitary, there's nothing to say, right? So from this point of view, clearly this system has to be unitary in its evolution. But the challenge then and now is calculating this process at stronger coupling when the horizon is macroscopic. And we want to explain why the semi-classical system looks like it has an information paradox, even though you know, microscopically, clearly there's something unitary going on. Okay, so just to be, so, so, that, so the next step you might say is, well, you, you, know, you, you want to go away from the very weak coupling limit where you can think about this as thin sheets, you know, D-brains in space. And you know, there's been some progress on that too. So, you know, over many years, Samir Mathur especially, and, and Oleg Lunin, along with the many, many works of uh, uh, Josef Bena and Nick Warner, have shown that at least some fraction of these microstates, the D-brain, you know, bound states that make up black hole microstates, can actually have be given a more macroscopic uh, space-time realization, which you might poetically call some sort of foamy structure, right? You know, so when you look at the macro, those states that have a good description in you know, in gravity, in classical gravity or semi-classical gravity, they look like they have all kinds of topological complications, holes and bubbles and wormholes and so on in a sort of a dense gas. So you might imagine that really these kinds of microstates that are talked about uh, as D-brains at uh, stronger coupling have some kind of foamy structure at the Planck scale and that you might hope that the whole puzzle about black holes arises because, well, this is a very complicated, very small thing. And if you look at the universal response of typical probes like gravitons, they'll basically give a universal answer. You know, in comes the graviton, goes bump, 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 bounces around, comes back out, it'll do that in some typical way. And this gives you an effective black hole, although very atypical and precise measurements should sense the state. So that's basically uh, the idea in this whole program for addressing the black hole information paradox was to reduce the problem in quantum gravity to Statistical physics, you know, the standard story in statistical physics. You've got very complicated microstates. You've got very many of them. They're hard to tell the details of, and therefore it looks like a black hole, right? So that was the, that's the central idea of that whole program. So let's see how that works. By the way, any questions so far? So I had a simple question uh, about uh, the string theory picture. Yeah. Of counting uh, microstates. Uh, this yeah. only works for uh, black holes in flat space. It's uh, the cosmological constant is zero or... Uh, does it work for uh, um, ADS or DS spaces as well? 
so the uh, classic calculation was uh, originally done, of course, for extremal and near extremal black holes of flat space. But all of those black holes, the ones that are extremal or near extremal, actually have anti desiderate throats. And in fact, the anti desiderate CFT, ADS CFT correspondence essentially is an argument that the throat region of the black hole is equivalent to the quantum field theory of the D-brains. So in that sense, for the extremal, near extremal black holes and anti desiderate space, there's also a counting. You just go to the dual holographic description, you fix the charges and you ask how many states they have. It's the same, it's the same calculation. That's because the near horizon limits of the uh, charged black holes of flat space involve anti desitter spaces. Desitter space is another story, so we do not have a complete accounting. We also do not have an accounting of this kind for uh, you know, the things you might make astrophysically, namely Schwarzschild black holes. So that's uh, very much an open question, very interesting one. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. So next step, okay, so what do we do with this? So how can you, given that you have this kind of microscopic understanding, at least for some black holes, you should be able to, for those black holes, solve the information problem. So what are you going to do? So I'm going to describe various attacks on that problem, right, to show you what kinds of progress people were able to make. So whoops, uh, here we go. Great. So our question is, what are these complex microstates and why are they hard to detect? And going back to the previous speaker's question, the easiest way, the simplest way to attack such a thing is you know, to try to simplify the problem uh, effectively by putting the black hole in a box and letting it come to equilibrium with radiation. Because then you don't have to deal with the dynamics of the thing is getting smaller and radiating away into, the, into asymptotic infinity and things like that. And as I think most of this audience knows, the covariant way to do that is to simply place the black hole in a universe with a negative cosmological constant. That's the action. And that's because, you know, the vacuum uh, um, solution with a negative cosmological constant is anti desitter space. This here is the metric of anti desitter space. And globally, anti desitter space is a cylinder. And the cylinder, effectively, for any you know, massive particle, will have a a potential barrier, right, um, that protects the uh, you from hitting the boundary. So basically, you throw a ball out, it goes out, comes in, goes out, and comes in. And so, in effect, this is a confining potential for any finite energy quanta. So, anti-desitter space indeed has black holes. This is the metric. This is a Schwarzschild type black hole in in anti-desitter space. So, there's the one plus r squared over l squared, which is the asymptotic anti-desitter structure, minus r naught squared over r squared. r naught has to do with the mass and the temperature of the black hole. And if the uh, black hole is large, it comes to equilibrium with its radiation. Also famously, as you know, string theory in asymptotically anti-desitter spaces is equivalent to a quantum field theory on the boundary. Now, let's come back to the information problem in this setting. So, well, look, so um, I'm going to think about the information problem not here as saying that the black hole radiates away because it doesn't. It comes to equilibrium with the radiation. Uh, and then somehow I have to decode the black hole from its radiation. But I'm going to instead ask the question as, how can I figure out what the state of the black hole is? So the system is actually unitary. You know, I could have made this black hole an anti desitter space, but dropping in, let's say, a shock wave or a bunch of quanta from... Uh, from the boundary of ADS space. I could start here, drop something in, and make the black hole. And so if the system is unitary, then at some later time after I made the black hole, let's say over there, I should be able to use data outside the black hole to decode the state of the black hole. So how would I do that is the question I want to go after. And so we'll take as our example the standard workhorse example, the ads CFT correspondence, which is the ADS5 cross S5 string theory, which is dual to the SUN Yang Mills theory with 16 supercharges on the boundary cylinder. Right. And so as uh, I think most of this audience knows, there's this dictionary run, uh, relating anti desitter space and the Yang-Mills theory. Um, so the pertinent things for us are, of course, there's the ADS scale, the string coupling and the string length. Those are translated into the N, the uh, rank of the gauge group, the Yang-Mills theory and its coupling constant. Um, uh, two other important things for us is we're going to be interested in the semi-classical limit because we want a nice big classical black hole. And that effectively, if you track these parameters, involves taking large n. So we have a large n gauge theory, which is difficult to compute in exactly. And finally, we're interested in, we're going to be interested in states and gravity of different masses, very heavy masses. And the standard dictionary in the ads CFT correspondence says that the mass m of a state in gravity translates into a field theory state in the dual theory of energy e, where um, 
uh, and uh, which is made by an operator with a conformal dimension, delta equals ml. So you take the mass of the state in gravity, you multiply by this ADS scale, and then if you do that, you get the conformal dimension of the operator that's supposed to make the state. Now, we're going to be interested in microstates of black holes, but these are going to be very, very heavy operators with very high conformal dimension. So we're going to see, suppose I made such states, what would it take to decode what the state is? Everybody with me? Any questions? Okay. So once again, here's the metric of a black hole in anti-dissider space in, in ADS-5. It has a mass r naught squared over the uh, Newton constant. And so if you work out what the conformal dimension of the operator making such a state is, it will turn out to be proportional to n squared, where n is the n of the SUN yang mills theory, and it's a very big number. Okay. So um, if you work out what the entropy is, area over uh, G Newton, it'll turn out to be proportional to n squared also, which means that we're expecting e to the n squared such microstates. So, um, you know, people are not usually actually, it, it's actually hard to overemphasize how many microstates this is. We're not really familiar in regular physics with this kind of you know, density of microstates. But anyway, there's a huge number of them. Now, how do you make such a thing? Well, if you believe the ADS CFTT corresponds to make the microstate, you should take an operator with a conformal dimension n squared and apply it to the vacuum. Just for reference, if you make a supergravity state, like a graviton or you know, some Kaluza-Klein excitation or something, these things have conformal dimension of order one, strings have conformal dimensions of order G string n to the one half, and D brains have, have conformal dimensions of order n. So really the black hole acts like it's n D brains that have been collected together into one location. So let's ask the next question. What do such microstate operators look like? Right. So how do you make an operator in a Yang-Mills theory? Well, the way you make an operator is you take all the fields of the theory. So here, that's the gauge field, the fermions, the scalars, and so on. And you multiply them out into a long polynomial, let's say. Um, and then you take some traces and determinants, whatever. You take some traces in order to make the thing gauge invariant. So here's an example. You, know, you take trace of x, x, y, x bar, z, z, x bar, you know, whatever. You make a very, very long thing. And to get a conformal dimension of order n squared, you're going to need of order n squared monomials, or order n squared letters in this, in this long word, if you like. You're gonna to have to multiply order n squared fields together. Of course, I'm being a little schematic here. You get to sprinkle traces in many places and derivatives and stuff like that. And I'm being especially schematic because there's no supersymmetry here. We're talking about non-supersymmetric states. So they're going to renormalize and mix. And the traces are going to split up and things like this. But schematically, at some level, this is a quasi-quantitative or qualitative argument here that I'm giving. Right? You're going to have a very long polynomial. The black hole microstate is made by some very long polynomial with order n squared letters in, in the fields of the yang mills theory. So now I'm going to make a claim. Suppose you make a state by applying such an enormous operator to the vacuum. Now let OP be any probe whatsoever then I'm going to claim that the correlation function of a probe in this state, so the correlation function of any probe in a black hole microstate, is basically going to depend only on the conformal dimension and the global charges of the black hole microstate, O, and of the probe, up to some exponentially small corrections. So we can make an argument for this very, very easily using basically statistics. We don't even need to use any you know, quantum anything. So the first piece of the argument is that suppose you make very, very long polynomials out of the fields of the theory. Now, almost all very long polynomials look statistically random. So you can show this, that if you add any structure, so namely if you try to structure the x's and the y's and the a's in any way, it'll reduce the number of polynomials you can make. So almost all long strings built out of the fields of the theory are statistically random. Okay, so where all the letters in the field, so the, the gauge field and the scalar fields and the fermions, et cetera, are used essentially uniformly. Second, there's a theorem that says that suppose you consider a particular um, um, uh, um, uh, long polynomial in which the distribution, if you like, of the fields, x's and y's and z's and things like this, is, um, isn't the uniform distribution. So it isn't statistically random then you'll find that the fraction of such um, atypical you know, uh, state, uh, uh, operators and thus of atypical states that have structure in them that doesn't look statistically random declines exponentially 
according to the, uh, with the exponent being the conformal dimension times the relative entropy, uh, the relative entropy is this quantity here, between the uniform distribution and the actual distribution of letters that you're talking about. So this basic what this says is that the, the atypical fraction of states and operators declines exponentially. So this says that almost all of the black hole microstates are going to look statistically random because of this. There's no other way to build them. So now consider such a state and consider calculating a correlator in it. So here I have some very long polynomial. This is supposed to be of order n squared letters. So I have you know, the bra and the cat, and I'm gonna probe it with a graviton, right? So here modeled as trace xx and trace xx dagger. So this is the graviton two point function in some very big state. So if you imagine doing the calculation, then each term in the correlator is going to be determined by the patterns of contraction. But those patterns of contraction also completely determined by the statistics of random polynomials. And this is gonna be true for all probes at essentially any length. So what that tells us is that you can take any probe you want and you're going to get effectively the same answer up to tiny exponentially small corrections. And therefore, there's basically almost no way using standard correlation functions, the standard kinds of observables that we use in quantum field theory, there's gonna be almost no way to tell what microstate you're talking about because the microstates are very long, complex, and statistically random. Right? So in effect, it will look like you can't access the information about the microstate, but it looks as though you've lost the information, even if it's actually there. Okay, so any questions? Sorry, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Um, just uh, the operators that do the black hole microstates, is there, is it any polynomial which has this conformal dimension n squared or is there some kind of recipe to construct operators which uh, make black hole microstates? No, I think it's, uh, so we want to think here that they are all possible polynomials because we're imagining here that the macroscopic quantum numbers are given, you know, the mass and the charge and you're allowed anything, but you'll find that the atypical ones, right? Uh, that don't look statistically random. Like for example, you could take trace of X to the N squared, that kind of thing, you know, um, uh, are extremely rare. So every once in a while, you can make such a state that doesn't look sort of black hole-like, but they are uh, you know, suppressed uh, enormously in, uh, and the semi-classical limit is a vanishing fraction. So, but otherwise, we're here considering an ensemble that contains everything. Did that answer the question? Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks you. Okay. Uh, a naive uh, question, uh, sorry. Uh, in uh, extended, uh, uh, well, uh, field theories with extended supersymmetry have uh, some states which are more spatial than others, yes. namely uh, these BPS states which are uh, in uh, the short representation. Yes. Um, do they, I mean, those BPS states correspond to something special on the black hole side? Under yes, this, uh, they do. So that's those kinds of states are actually very, very helpful because you can construct such states without expecting them to renormalize like crazy. Mm -hmm. So uh, in particular, if you look at the half BPS states, so things that preserve, you know, um, uh, or quarter BPS states, you know, things that preserve 16 or eight supercharges, they have many non-renormalization properties that make these kinds of arguments much more reliable. Unfortunately, typically things that have, you know, uh, extended supersymmetry, eight, 16 supercharges, that kind of thing, um, also tend not to be, uh, the, the dual description in gravity tends not to be a black hole of finite area. So you'll typically be able to get black holes, but black holes of zero area. Nevertheless, those are extremely useful laboratories, and I will discuss, I will discuss such an example in about three slides. I see, thank you. And uh, just a comment, and maybe you can do it later, it's not important here, but uh, this uh, uh, distribution of uh, random polynomials and uh, well, the information theory related to them, that can be made sense just in uh, Yang-Mills theory as well? Yes, in, so this uh, is, sorry? Yeah, sorry, so go on, please. I mean, that can be made in these uh, extended uh, uh, Yang-Mills series with uh, extended supersymmetry as well. Yes, so this is intended to be a Yang-Mills theory with extended supersymmetry, but in particular, the uh, one thing you can do here is, for example, in the N equals four super Yang-Mills theory, which is this is intended to be, you could consider the half BPS states, and mm -hmm. the half BPS states, you know, for example, uh, are associated to, uh, and if you fix the charge of the state, you can imagine that you only get polynomials in X here, right? 
And so mm -hmm. there's an entire theory of the polynomials uh, in X and you know, the gauge invariant representations. And actually in this paper, which is cited down here, we proceed to show that you know, every single one of these states uh, can be associated to a Young diagram, that in the space of all Young diagrams, there's a typical Young diagram, and that N is very large uh, here, then almost all uh, half VPS states lie close in their Young diagram description to a particular Young diagram with some limit curve. From that, you can derive a black hole solution that is the universal description of them, uh, but it has zero area. <laughs> okay, so, thank you. So, so yeah, that can definitely be done, and it's interesting to do. Yeah. So I'm discussing this, uh, you know. So um, just to preview what's going to happen in the second half of the talk, all of this is an attempt that I'm describing, or I'm describing, you know, I guess my own group's personal attempts to to uh, think about the information paradox from the microscopic point of view. There are states there. String theory is supposed to tell us, you know, the states of quantum gravity. These are all attempts to try to address the issue from the microscopic point of view. The remarkable thing that we'll discuss in the second and the later part of the talk is the is that there has been recent progress actually addressing the question already within the effective semi-classical theory. That's a further development on top of these, which is kind of cool in my opinion that uh, one is able to do that. Okay, so but to keep going, uh, this all. Uh, uh, so the next step is okay, great. So so this so you might say, well, you know, this iffy business here because you know these are non-supersymmetric operators; they'll renormalize, etc. So I'm, I'm sort of reaching a little bit, but actually, that's an extremely general argument that it's just not going to be the case that information is being lost um, from black holes. So here's the very very general argument, right? So I'm just going to assume that black hole entropy arises from underlying discrete microstates. So this is just a statement that the entropy of black holes as derived by Hawking, Bekenstein, and company, Barter, uh, Carty, uh, Bar <laughs> Barty and Carter, Hawking, and Bekenstein, that that black hole entropy has a statistical interpretation. I'm just going to assume that. And that there exists a quantum theory of gravity which can explain the entropy microscopically. So what does this mean, right? So well, first of all, um, uh, uh, so roughly, uh, so basically, that means that within some, you know, energy resolution, you can find uh, a discrete number of microstates, which equals the log of the entropy, uh, the, uh, the log of the degeneracy, which is the entropy. Okay. So now let's think about those microstates. So suppose we agree that quantum mechanics is consistent also. So in quantum mechanics, it's generic that the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is generically non-degenerate up to symmetry. So leaving aside, you know, rotational symmetries, this, that, and the other, every black hole microstate if you agree that there's a whole bunch of discrete microstates, must have a unique mass, right, so up to symmetries. Now, I also know that in gravity, mass is a quantity that's defined and measured at infinity. There's no local notion of mass. You have to measure it, you know, using a gas law at infinity. So this immediately tells you that if every microstate has a different energy up to symmetries, then a precise mass measurement at infinity should allow an asymptotic observer to measure the black hole microstate. You measure the mass carefully, and you know what the microstate is if you also have in your hands a big computer and knowledge of the theory of gravity and of this black hole. So there you go, right? So that should be it. So, but then how, so you might say, wait, hey, then why was it puzzled in the first place? Okay, great. So then we can answer that by thinking about how precise your measurement needs to be. So we know that if the entropy of the black hole is S, then we agree that within the energy resolution delta E of your measuring device, you must have N of E, uh, some, some number of states. That's a degeneracy, right? And so suppose you take the energy resolution you're going to make a measurement at to be you know, some number of Planck, Planck masses. You know, pick, pick, pick your resolution, but let's say some number of Planck masses. Then you know that the level spacing has to be, uh, has to go like, e to the minus entropy. So you need e to the entropy, e to the s states between e and e plus delta e. So the level spacing must go as e to the minus s. So there's a super Planck in precision. This is where the quantum gravity has to come in. Something has to give you such an enormously degenerate spectrum, and that has to be the quantum gravity. Okay, so let, grant me that. But now suppose I want to measure the mass of such a state, right, uh, with, the, with the requisite precision. Well, okay, so I need this precision. I need the gap is e to the minus s. 
But I know from general ideas in quantum mechanics that there's a rule that, that says delta E delta T is bigger than or equal to H bar. Namely, to make a measurement with the precision delta E, you need a time delta T. And here, delta T will be bigger than H bar over delta E. So this means we need time of order E to the plus entropy, right? So this, because the gap was e to the minus entropy, the resolution, to get that resolution, you need time of order e to the plus entropy. Now, it's also the case that the entropy goes as area of the black hole divided by four g Newton h bar. So this means that if you take the semi-classical limit, which is to say you fix the Newton constant, fix the area of the black hole, and you send h bar to zero, semi-classical limit, then the amount of time required to measure things is infinity, right? Strictly infinity in this limit that h bar is zero. So this tells us through very general arguments, just, you know, uh, 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 the three things we've used here is the entropy makes sense uh, from statistical physics. Uh, gravity is gravity, so you measure mass at infinity. Quantum mechanics is quantum mechanics. And so, you know, there's, a, uh, uh, there's an energy time uncertainty and every state will have a unique energy. So using these sort of very general ingredients, we can conclude that all information about the state to decode the state is present at infinity because the mass will be present at infinity. But the semi-classical observer has no hope of accessing this because in the h bar to zero limit, the time scale necessary uh, goes to infinity. And so from this point of view, the usual diagram that we draw with a causally disconnected interior for a black hole is an artifact of replacing e to the one over h bar by infinity. So, so, again, so again, we see that if you agree that you're actually going to do these high precision measurements, well, you know, the information is available, but semi-classical effective field theory probes will not be able to give you this information. So uh, this is a very general argument making that case. Any questions? Okay. So, um, Sarantan, how far am I, along am I in my talk? We continue. <laughs> no problem. Well, um, I'm uh, about halfway right now. Is that about yeah, right? Yeah, it's perfect. No okay. problem. OK, so then um, I'm going to do one more example along these lines of trying to use the microscopic reasoning somehow to come up with a, uh, you know, to understand uh, how the information may or may not be recovered. So here I want to focus on an example that's related to a question that I was asked a little while back, which is what happens if you look at, you know, um, states that have sufficient supersymmetry that you can control these things on all, on all the sides, right? you know, extended supersymmetry. So let's consider in particular the MU, so, so I'm going to, uh, the, the arguments that I just made, I'm going to make precise in this setting. So I'm going to consider the BTZ black hole in three dimensions with a negative cosmological constant. And uh, I'm going to consider in particular the, the zero mass black hole, that's this thing here, right? And if I look at the zero mass black hole, this is its metric in three dimensions. So we're going to embed this black hole in string theory. And uh, we can embed this black hole in uh, string theory on ABS3 uh, cross S3 cross T4. So basically, there's a sphere and a, and a torus going along for the ride. And the metric in the macroscopic ABS3 dimensions looks like this. Now, the standard description of this black hole, uh, the dual description, is in a 4-4, so eight supercharged supersymmetric sigma model uh, with this target space, T4 to the N mod SN. So this is actually the free limit of the theory. You're supposed to deform away from that limit. But um, we're going to work in this free limit uh, as much as possible. And so in this correspondence, so this is going to go a little bit fast, uh, this section, because I just want to illustrate uh, that this can be done. All of these things can be done concretely when you have enough supersymmetry. So suppose you consider the M equals 0 BTZ black hole. In the field theory, it corresponds to taking this sigma model, so this two-dimensional conformal field theory, which is dual to it, and putting it in a sector in which both the left and the right moving Hamiltonians are zero. So that's why L naught plus L naught bar corresponds to the mass N. And there's no, uh, uh, and this theory also has an R charge. It has a left moving and a right moving R charge. You set those equal to zero too, because we're taking a charge less uh, and non-rotating black hole. Okay, so you have to take such a state. Now, there's a great deal of lore that about such, uh, about this system, both the BTZ black hole and the dual field theory. So I'm going to recite the lore to you and um, I'm not expecting you to follow all the details. And then I'm going to tell you the result. Okay. So it turns out that such states with L0 equals L0 bar and with, you know, vanishing charges can be constructed explicitly in the field theory. 
as a product of uh, uh, things called twist operators. What is a twist operator? So, well, so this is a sigma model with some target space T4 to the n mod Sn. So you can think about the sigma model as consisting of n different strands of you know, n different conformal field theories, which can be joined or not joined. So they can be, you know, they can be joined to one long strand like that, or they can be joined into, you know, partial strands, you know, three here and three here, and then disconnected in between. There's many ways of organizing how you join the strands of the conformal field theory together. And there are things called twist operators that, you know, you apply them and they change the twist sector, namely how much these things are connected up or not. Okay, so this is a, this is the, low energy effective description of the D1, D5, P system that I described earlier as one of the canonical you know, uh, black hole systems in string theory. Anyway, there's a certain number of bosonic and fermionic uh, twist operators. And you can show that the M equals zero BTZ microstates are created by acting with a product of the bosonic and the fermionic twist operators with a particular rule that the total twist number should add up to M. So I'm not explaining to you why that comes out to be the case. But please take for granted that I should apply such a twist operator to the vacuum of this theory, and it'll create a black hole microstate. And that's like the earlier statement for the n equals four super Yang mills. If you take a random polynomial of some kind, this is a polynomial, and, and I, I should apply this polynomial to the vacuum. So, so you could ask, if n is very large, what do these polynomials look like? And you can, uh, you can show that almost all such polynomials, again, look like random distributions of sigmas and taus. So you have a random string, and this random string is going to act on the vacuum, and, uh, uh, and that creates a black hole microstate. And so the typical such random string has a Bose-Einstein distribution of bosonic um, uh, twist operators and a, and a Fermi-Dirac distribution of uh, fermionic twist operators. So again, I'm asking you to take this for granted as uh, you know, we've done that calculation correctly. So what you should think is there are many, many such operators with their bosonic and fermionic twist distributions distributed in some way according to the statistics of random distributions. So now what's our question? Our question is that's a black hole microstate and there are many, 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 many such black hole microstates. And my goal, if I want to solve the information paradox is to say, I'm gonna take a little graviton probe or something and I want to read out the microstate. Surely I should be able to do so because this is just a, in the dual description, this is just a unitary field theory in a complicated state. Surely I have to be able to read out the state by doing some sort of correlation function. So, okay, so you can do that. So you can construct a probe operator. So there's some complexities involving, you know, which probe you pick and this, that, and the other. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick a probe operator, which corresponds to, remember, this is ADS3 cross S3 cross T4. So for example, you can take a probe which corresponds to metric fluctuation of the T4. That's an example of a probe of this black hole. And you want to compute correlation functions like this. So there's a, uh, here's the black hole microstate and you want to compute A dagger A. So anyway, so this is the, this complicated state made from twist operators. A is you can think about this as a graviton operator, okay? So the techniques for doing such calculations have been well developed, uh, especially by Samir Mathur and, um, and Lunin and others. So there's an explicit prescription in the orbifold limit, so in the free limit of this field theory, there's an explicit prescription for how to do these calculations. So we're just gonna do that. So you do that, and if you compute this correlation function in this field theory, you get a complicated answer of this kind, right? So some very complicated sum, you know, with many, many terms in it. So now I can do a different calculation. I can calculate in using standard ads CFT techniques I can compute the two-point function of a graviton operator in the BTC background. So this is the gravity calculation. Effectively, that involves taking the Feynman propagator for the graviton and then taking the boundary limit. So that's the usual way in which we get, a, get, the, uh, get the graviton, uh, you know, we, we get a correlation function out of, out of the ADS calculations. And if you do that, using the method of images, you find this answer over here. Notice that this answer does not initially look like the answer we get from the field theory. But what you can show is that if you do this calculation and compare these two expressions, despite the fact that they look different, for a very long time that grows with n, n remember n is the, uh, like the central charge of the system, it's like the size of the system, and the semi-classical limit is n goes to infinity. For a very long time, in fact, this quantity, this sum here, is essentially identical up to exponentially small corrections 
to this sum here. In other words, for a very long time, in fact, the field theory answer is completely universal. It gives the same answer as in the BTZ black hole, even though there may be many different black hole microstates in which you might be computing. If you take more, almost all of these states, you compute the graviton correlation function in them, and you discover that the answer almost exactly matches the gravity result. However, at sufficient, uh, oh, sorry, the gravity result in the BTZ black hole. However, you will also find that at sufficiently large times, you will start seeing this correlator here, the field theory correlator, showing pseudo-random fluctuations that depend on the detailed form of the actual microstate. So for a long time, it's universal, and then it begins to fluctuate kind of randomly. And you can study this in a bit more detail, and you'll see that there's this initial dip, which is universal, then this kind of ramps up, and then it fluctuates pseudo-randomly. And if you sort of do, do a little bit of time averaging, of this correlation function, you'll we find can, that this becomes smooth. This kind of uh, uh, OTOC word plotting? So we're not doing an OTOC. You could do an OTOC uh, here too. But what's going on, uh, 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 so this is not an OTOC, but it's related to the OTOC type phenomena because of course this is a black hole and there's going to be chaos, this, that, and the other here. Indeed, you see there's this dip ramp plateau going mm -hmm. on. The reason why it's not exactly the same as some of the chaos uh, story and in the SYK story is actually in the free limit, this theory is integrable. It just has a very dense spectrum. So what you're seeing is the echo of what's going to become chaos if you turn on the coupling and make this strongly coupled. So all I'm trying to justify here is that if you have a sufficiently dense and complicated spectrum, you see the sort of universal early behavior, then a kind of ramp in the two-point function, then a plateau along the lines of things that people see, for example, the SYK model. But, and that further, if you take the H bar to zero limit, basically this scale, our n to infinity, the scale moves out. And so this part, which is universal, will move out to infinite time and it'll be universal the whole way. You'll get exactly the BTZ M equals zero answer. So the lessons here are the information about the microstate was definitely available at infinity, right? If you computed the two-point function in the field theory, you get these pseudo-random fluctuations at sufficiently late times, which definitely tell you what the state is. However, however, if you take the early times, you know, the BTZ M equals zero is the correct effective classical geometry because it describes the universal part of this at the early times exactly. And what's more, if you agree that you're going to do imprecise measurements and you don't have time to wait this long, then you're never going to see the pseudo-random fluctuations and you will lose information. So all of this, it seems completely kind of, um, except for the insane density of states bequeathed to us by quantum gravity, it otherwise seems like it's uh, uh, entirely conventional in its, uh, as a story in how uh, you get you know, universal coarse grain behavior from statistical physics. Okay, so again, uh, what does all of this teach us? So this is the sort of end of the first part, right? It's, we've seen in multiple examples now, starting from qualitative arguments, sort of very general arguments, you know, detailed arguments with supersymmetry in supersymmetric systems and stuff like that, that information about the microstates is definitely available at infinity. So there's no lost information, right? But it's very hard to measure. And uh, going back to your question a moment ago, Santan, um, uh, I haven't had time today to discuss the dynamical phenomena of scrambling and chaos and thermalization, which make things even more complicated because they mix the information about the incoming states, which makes it very difficult to access the information using simple observables. So anyway, let me repeat the bottom line. So from all of this, it seems like black holes are just conventional complex systems that lose information through standard core screening, right? It's just that they have a ridiculously dense density of states that is non perturbative in the Newton coupling. So that sort of makes them seem kind of crazy, but otherwise they're completely standard. So in this view, to see the unitarity of the system, you must know the microstates, right? You must know the microstates and the semi-classical effective description is simply not enough because you know, uh, the correlation functions, the standard correlation functions, uh, finite endpoint correlation functions with, a, you know, with some uh, uh, order one time separating them will not tell you the details. So that seems to be the bottom line from thinking in this way. Any questions? So naive questions about the last slide. I just want to understand the geometry of uh, these uh, BTZ black holes better. Um, first of all, these uh, equivalents that you say of these uh, partition functions, this, so C in the expression above is the speed of light. That's a constant because it doesn't appear downstairs. 
You mean this? No, um, the letter C, yeah. Um, ha, beats me. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is that C? Well, if you're happy to say it's the speed of light, I'm happy to say the speed of light. But uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know what's your guess from my side. I just didn't see it in the second formula. And since I was trying to uh, compare them and try to see if one can show mathematically an equivalence. Uh, oh, yes, you can. You can. So I forget what the C is. Um, uh, maybe it's the speed of light and maybe it's a normalization that goes away or something. I, I forget. But the way in which you see the equivalence is that if you, uh, you see, there's a sum here on a whole bunch of integers, right? And mm -hmm. so if you take n, uh, what you want to do is, uh, uh, you know, if the argument of the sign is sufficiently small, right? Mm -hmm. uh, oops, what, what just happened? Uh, then you'll find that, uh, you know, the sign will become something like this quantity, right? You see this? Right. Thing, yep. right? Yep. Yep. So, yep. so the, what you're supposed to do to show uh, explicitly this equivalent, that for a very long time, for a period of time, this, the ratio of CBTZ and CT is one, is you see this NN, these are the distribution of twists. So basically, remember there's a Bose-Einstein distribution of the bosonic twists and the um, and the and a certain distribution of the fermionic twists. So when you so when you do the sum, what you do is you estimate in the sum what dominates mm -hmm. at some given time, right? So by seeing what dominates, you uh, so you pick a time t, and by looking at what dominates the sum, you can show that for a certain period of time, this expression equals this expression. Okay, cool. But there's nothing fancy like um, S-duality or that these things are modular and there's tau going to one over tau. That was... No, no. What I like about this class of argument, it is just so boneheadedly simple. Right? <laughs> it's just doing standard statistical everything. And all it's of this elegant. stuff... Well, yeah, it's elegant. Yeah, all of this stuff comes out very nicely. So again, that makes you feel like black holes are standard statistical systems. That's what we want, right? The standard rules apply. It's just that there's a crazy non-perturbative quantum gravity density of states. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so just a question about uh, BDC. These are charged black holes. Yes. But and the, the charge is determined, well, in string theory, it's usually determined by uh, classes in the uh, middle cohomology of your Calabi-Yau. So in yes. this case, it's some special limit of T4. Yeah. So in this particular case, I chose a non uh, a zero charge black hole. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Equal zero, equals zero. Two equals zero. Uh, yeah. Now you can add charges to this in various ways. You can add rotation on the ADS side. Uh, mm -hmm. The rotation will on the ADS side will correspond to these charges J and J naught. Well, it'll correspond to L naught minus L naught bar being non-zero, right? Rotation of the ADS side. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, you can add charges associated with the uh, S three in different ways, and that corresponds with J and J bar. Okay, okay. So so very hard charges. And okay. And uh, last question. So we know that uh, the boundary of this BDZ black hole is a genus one surface. The BTZ uh, black hole itself is a genus one handle body. It's basically H3 mod out by uh, a diagonal matrix. The BTZ black hole boundary is a genus one surface. Um, the eternal non-zero mass black hole has two boundaries, oh, okay. each of them being a cylinder. Wait, so this is uh, in uh, Euclidean signature or a Lorentzian? Idiot? So this is Lorentzian. So this is the Lorentzian. Yeah, I was talking about Euclidean, okay. Yeah, yeah, oh uh, yeah, oh yeah. So the Euclidean one of course can accept, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, so I take that back. Thank you. Yeah, no, but that's that's pertinent to you could then, you know, later on in this talk, of course, the thing kind of thing we're going to start discussing is that uh, nowadays uh, we realize that the Euclidean path integral seems to know a heck of a lot more about the Lorentzian microstates than one would have expected. You can do an a Euclidean path integral and take the saddle point somehow sums over some of these effects of these microstates, it appears to be the case, in which case all of these considerations become relevant. Ah, cool. Okay, so more of that. Okay. Thanks, you see. Um, okay. I, have, I have one question, which is kind of naive, but uh, what I don't understand, if we want to, if we would like, for example, get the formula for the entropy of a black hole out of microstates, and we assume that the microstates are non-degenerate, right? Um, yes. 
then the entropy is at least for a canonic micro canonical ensemble is the logarithm of the number of microstates. Yes. And if it's non-degenerate for a given energy, then the entropy should be zero. Yes. So, but we're always talking about the, um, uh, you know, the sum energy resolution we're really talking about when you talk about what the entropy of the system is. So if I talk okay. about probability, right, you're not, you're not going to resolve these states uh, at close in the Planck mass. So there's implicitly in that effective description, okay. there is an energy resolution. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. So as a segue into the second part of the talk, I want to sort of discuss the information and information theoretic perspective on all of this. So we're stepping back from all these details of the microstates. So I'm going to basically repeat an argument due to Donald Page as for another kind of signature of unitarity in the black hole. So, you know, I've been talking about how, well, you know, you know, you know, you have a unitary description if you can read off what went to the black hole by looking at the Hawking radiation, or if you can go to infinity away from an ADS black hole and read off what the microstate is, then you for sure know everything is unitary. But here's another kind of more subtle signature as described by Page. So you imagine, you remember in the beginning when we talked about Hawking radiation, we said you pair produce quanta just outside the horizon, and then one falls in, one falls out, so the interior becomes entangled with the radiation. So if you look at Hawking, you know, Hawking computed the uh, thermodynamic entropy, if you like. well, he computed the entropy of the radiation and said, well, law looks thermal, but that means the entropy of the radiation keeps increasing without bound. Now, Page points out that suppose this process continues and eventually, you know, half of the uh, 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 quanta have sort of emerged, then what's going to happen is at this point, this, there's not enough um, uh, 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 the, 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 the entanglement entropy, as opposed to the thermodynamic entropy, the entanglement entropy of the radiation has to start decreasing if physics is unitary. And why is that? You know, thermodynamic entropy can keep increasing because you've coarse grained this and that and you've sort of uh, forgotten about stuff. But entanglement entropy involves a certain number, a subsystem, another subsystem, and you know, the pattern of entanglement, you compute, you trace out one subsystem, you compute the von Neumann entropy of the other subsystem. And because of monogamy of entanglement, namely, you know, uh, qubits can't share their entanglement with more than one other qubit, right? You know, you, you can saturate the total amount of entanglement that a given qubit can have. Because of this, it follows that as the number of qubits, if you like, on the interior of the black hole decreases as it evaporates away, it must be that the entanglement entropy of the, uh, of the, of the Hawking radiation also decreases because there's nothing to be entangled with until eventually after the black hole is radiated away. If physics is unitary, the entanglement ent entropy or more accurately, the von Neumann entropy of the Hawking radiation must be zero again. So that's this curve. It goes up and then it goes down. So he said that one of the signatures of unitarity would be if you could compute the entanglement entropy of Hawking radiation, it would increase and then it would decrease. And something like anti-disorder space, there's a wrinkle on this because you, know, you don't actually evaporate completely away. So instead you evaporate and then you sort of saturate the entanglement entropy because you come to equilibrium the radiation and the interior. So there's a number of bits inside, a number of bits outside, and they come to equilibrium and they should flatten. In any case, it can't increase without bound. So, and through similar kinds of reasoning, uh, Samir Mathur and, you know, Alnheri, uh, uh, Marolf, uh, Polchinski and Sully argued for sort of macroscopic uh, corrections, popularly called things like firewalls to black hole physics after half the radiation has emerged. Again, the basic idea is that entanglement entropy is a different kind of probe of unitarity than thermodynamic entropy. Thermodynamic entropy can increase, but you need to have this sort of falling phase or at least a saturating phase in ADS space. And that would be a test of unitarity, simply recovering the page curve from some kind of considerations, either microscopic or macroscopic. If you can recover the page curve, you have some hint that the unitarity has been destroyed. Okay, so that's an information theoretic perspective on all of this. Now, in this regard, there have been two uh, very exciting new developments in the last year that actually push a little bit against each other. So the first development is it seems that it may be possible to see unitarity in quantum gravity, at least in the entanglement entropy and the page curve that we just discussed, directly in semi-classical gravity without reference to the microstates. Personally, I find this amazing, right? I mean, because certainly I have to say that it just seemed 
clear that if you want to see uh, unitary dynamics in quantum gravity, you need your hands to the microstates because uh, how else are you going to get it, right? So as you'll see, this seems to have something to do with the Euclidean path integral knowing something about the underlying microscopics. But it seems to be that you can at least recover the page curve uh, using a, a, uh, uh, some novel considerations of semi-classic gravity. More on that in a minute. But then there's been another new development, which seems to run, at least to me, somewhat counter to the first one. So it seems, so it'll turn out that the, this first thing, seeing the unitarity, will turn out to revolve around allowing uh, Euclidean wormholes uh, when you do the path integral in, uh, in gravity. Right? So you, you, you allow you know, processes which involve you know, seeding uh, baby universes and wormholes in, in the semi-classical Euclidean gravity path integral. So um, uh, that same set of considerations has also been shown recently by Merle von Maxfield to actually suggest that uh, gravitating theories, where the Euclidean path integral permits these kinds of wormholes, may actually be dual to ensembles of theory and not a single unitary theory. So in other words, there seems to be a tension here. On the one hand, uh, you know, allowing Euclidean wormholes seems to lead to unitary page curve. On the other hand, it, at least in some cases, it suggests that the dual is an ensemble of theories, but then that's not a unitary quantum theory. So, um, but very exciting. Both of these are developments in a semi-classical treatment of gravity, especially Euclidean gravity. And that's what I'm going to turn to now. Any questions? Okay. So, okay, so how does this new development go? So, uh, I'm going to talk first about unitarity in quantum gravity and the so-called island formula that has appeared to try to correct um, um, the page curve. So here's the way the idea goes. So here's once again a picture of the page curve. So what you're supposed to do here is uh, this is the uh, you know time passing, and you're supposed to have here the uh, uh, thermodynamic entropy of the Hawking radiation. And as time passes, if you have you know uh, uh, things uh, in ADS with black holes of fixed mass, this curve is supposed to go up and flatten out. If it's supposed to be in flat space or something where the black hole radiates into the radiation and then goes away, it's supposed to go back, the page curve is supposed to go up back down. Okay. So the proposed solution to this, all right, the way you solve this problem of the Hawking entropy increasing uh, without bound uh, in semi-classical gravity involves the following proposal, right? So you say that suppose A, suppose what you do is you have the black hole and then it radiates and you collect the radiation in a reservoir B in a reservoir A. So this is a non-gravitating reservoir that I'm mentally using to collect the radiation. So I'm going to ask, what is the entanglement entropy of that radiation? This is the, the, the object that the page curve applies to. And the argument is that here's what I should do. I take the, uh, the, the region A, which collects the radiation, and then in the gravitating region, so this may involve the black hole and other things, I imagine an island call it B, and I keep an island there. Then I compute the standard effective field theory entanglement entropy, the usual thing I compute, in the union of my radiation reservoir and this island B, so that's this thing here. And then I add to it the area, the surface area of this island B divided by 4G Newton. So this is like a Bekenstein Hawking thing, but there's no horizon here. It's just some island that I cooked up on the, in the gravitating region. And then I minimize over all possible choices of B. Okay. And um, uh, amazingly, uh, if you like, so, so, okay, so whether you find it amazing or not depends on whether or not you follow the derivation. Uh, you, you can see that for an evaporating black hole, if you apply this formula, it's guaranteed to that the entanglement entropy of the radiation will follow eventually the horizon area of the black hole. So it'll either uh, become flat or it'll go back down. So this will cure the problem. The question really is, well, why would you cook this thing up other than doing answer analysis to get the correct answer for the page curve? And the answer is, um, there were a couple of uh, the, uh, uh, these authors uh, who uh, derived this, uh, gave us this formula, derived the formula in various ways. They used holography in two dimensions, and then they used um, um, uh, the replica trick in for JT gravity in two dimensions. So this is really derived for two-dimensional gravity coupled to matter. 
and you know these are solvable systems jt gravity is a solvable system and they were able to do the replica trick in that case there are various kinds of technical difficulties because you have the gravitational system that's sort of abutting the radiation system so then you have you know you have to find some way of you know pretending gravity doesn't exist here and then tying the things together so there are some technical issues uh, which are almost certainly not uh, not uh, important or material but in the end they propose this as a solution to the uh, to the uh, page curve puzzle so what I'm going to do today is in order to try to explain where this comes from, I'm going to try to take another tack on it. Um, uh, I mean, what do we want to know? We want to know, is this formula true? Where does it come from? And can we extend it to dimensions higher than two? So I'm going to try to make some progress on those points. So our setup is going to be, I'm going to go back to three-dimensional gravity, right? The, what we, which we already discussed, and the BTZ black hole, which we already discussed. But rather than taking the M equals zero BTC black hole, I'm going to take an honest to God, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, eternal, uh, finite mass, finite area, black hole. So here is the Penrose diagram of this three-dimensional black hole. There's the left region and the right region and so on. And um, so we're going to imagine that over here, just outside the boundary of the BTZ black hole, uh, there is some kind of radiation reservoir where we're going to collect all the radiation coming from it. And um, in this black hole, I've also drawn this uh, brain trajectory. So this is like a brain that's been dropped in and has this trajectory. You'll see why we want that brain later. So I'm just showing you the trajectories of something. So this is the, you know, the white hole region, the black hole region, the left asymptotic universe, the right asymptotic universe. And if I take this uh, dotted green line, you know, that's the, um, and I fill out the extra circle that's supposed to be there, uh, but not displayed in the Penrose diagram. That's the wormhole between the two asymptotic regions. So 3D gravity has many uh, you know, virtues. Uh, there's no local graviton, so you don't have to deal with dynamics. All solutions can be constructed through global identifications of the metrics. That's very, very helpful. Um, there are black holes. Uh, the BTZ black holes, as we've said, and there are also things called multi-boundary wormholes. So there, these are black hole-like things with multiple asymptotic regions and are thought inside the system connecting all of them. We'll use these in a minute. And everything can be solved explicitly in equations, but uh, beautifully, you can also reason everything out in pictures, which is very convenient for giving talks. So I'm going to try to explain all the results using the pictures that you can draw, the diagrams you can draw the results. So in this context, which is one higher dimension, so as in this three-dimensional context, I'm going to try to derive or justify the island formula in three dimensions using conventional holographic ideas. So we're going to apply essentially conventional holography to the system. And we're going to try to argue that it implies this island formula and cures the page curve. And we will also give a kind of replica trick derivation of the formula. OK, any questions so far? OK. So what are we going to do? So here is the time symmetric slice. So this is basically, if I look at this green dotted line on the Penrose diagram, that time symmetric slice looks like this. So it's a wormhole, like you know, usual eternal black holes, between some region A and some region B. And so um, in order to make some progress, I'm going to use a trick originally introduced by Kurkulu and Maldesena. And I, I don't want to think about eternal black hole. I really would like to think about a system that has microstates that I can, you know, Get some handle on. And we're going to imagine as a toy model, sort of putting those microstates in by kind of truncating this wormhole behind the horizon and keeping some, we'll call them end of the world brains here. So really what you should be really thinking about here is I'm trying to model here the idea that in string theory, the microstates in many black holes are described by, you know, states of debris, of, of brains of some kind. So we're building a toy model of that here, again, following these authors, where we place some end of the world brain behind the horizon that's going to cap the microstates on it. Okay, so the Hawking quant are going to escape this way into the reservoir, and we're going to imagine that these microstates on, which are going to sit on this brain behind the horizon, are maximally entangled with the Hawking quanta because you know if you actually calculated the Hawking uh, process, that's the kind of thing that would happen, right? So we're going to distill this entanglement into a subspace and then write the state as this. So I here are states of the Hawking radiation, and the psi i are states, you know, the microstates of the black hole. And so we suppose that after the radiation has happened, the whole thing has come to equilibrium, the whole system is in a state where the uh, black hole microstates are entangled in this kind of maximal sort of way with the radiation. So that's the sort of model we have of the system. Okay, so now what? So now I realize that suppose I go ahead and um, uh, take this end of the world brain 
to be itself describe a conformal field theory. So we're going to imagine that behind the horizon, there's a brain. The brain has a conformal field theory on it. And so because it has a conformal field theory on it, if it's strongly coupled and large end, this, that, and the other, which I expect it to be, then it itself can be replaced by its holographic dual. So we'll call this idea inception, like the movie, you know, dreams within dreams, that kind of thing. So the idea here is that there's this, there's this brain. And, you know, if I, um, uh, uh, and this, uh, this, this brain here, which is carrying the state of the black hole, can have uh, a different central charge, length scale, and you know, things like that, uh, as compared to the original space, the original space from which we started. This is just a brain, and we, you know, we want to write down the dual for the theory of this brain. And if we trace out the Hawking quanta over here, then the brain itself should get left in some maximally mixed kind of thermal-like state, and thus, the dual to, the D, to this D brain that's behind the horizon should itself contain a black hole. So just let me make sure that this has become clear, uh, what I'm trying to say. This, we have this brain here that was entangled with the Hawking radiation. We do the dual to the brain. That produces some other anti-desitter space behind the, behind the so, so this is the original anti-desitter space of the brain. And what I've drawn here is the gray disk here is another anti-desitter space that's sort of stuck to this. Uh, it's the dual to the theory on this brain. And the brain itself is in the thermal state because you know, if you trace out this radiation, this is in a mixed state. And therefore, this dual description, this inception disk, as we call it, should contain a black hole. Was that all clear? Questions? Well, a much more basic question, actually, even related to the previous slide. I just want to understand that. So you really do have two Hilbert spaces, one for um, IR, where the Hawking radiation lives, and one where the microstates live. And this expression is uh, in the product of the two Hilbert spaces. Yes. It's the standard uh, entanglement of uh, these two theories. And in yes. the next slide, I'm sorry, but that was... Uh, a lot of uh, uh, things going on at once. So, behind, so first of all, you call this horizon, which would be the minimal uh, geodesic surface if it's a three-dimensional wormhole. This thing here, yes. Yeah. And so behind it, now you have two different things, uh, or so it's either a brain. Yes. And so it's, uh, either, it's either a brain, mm -hmm. or, or you could replace the brain by its dual. And the dual will be some other you know, ADS space that completes this, you see? So originally this ADS space terminated at this end of the world brain. Right. So, but, but we can replace that end of the world brain by some other anti-desitor space. And I'll discuss the splicing conditions in a minute. Okay, so that space, I mean, there would be a different quantum theory on it and it would have its own Hilbert space or there's some... Right. Uh, yeah, well, this is the, it's the Hilbert space of the brain. It's the, okay, that was... Yeah, so, okay. so this thing, the psi eyes. I see. Yeah, and so the dual to that theory is supposed to be this disk. I see. Okay. No. So, right. So the original. So over here, there may be some theory which was dual to this anti-desitter space with the brain in it. But then the brain could have a dual which has you know this this disk, and that brain is in the thermal state because it was entangled with the Hawking radiation which we've traced out, and so that leaves this sort of this let's call it the inception disk uh, uh, with the black hole in it. So this horizon for this black hole is related to the entanglement temperature. I see. And it's okay. It is entangled with the theory on A, the new incepted black hole. Yeah, so, so A here is supposed to be outside this. as in, It's supposed to be a little box that collect, collects the radiation just outside. Right, it's outside the horizon of uh, the one of the black holes that you started off. It's outside the horizon. Well, I'm actually collecting it outside the boundary even. Imagine cutting off the boundary a little bit and turning off gravity just outside and collecting it. I'm trying to collect the radiation in such a way that doesn't have gravity on it. Okay. Okay. So in this kind of language, the evaporate, thanks very much for the questions, by the way. Please keep them coming because this is confusing. There are many things going on in every slide, as you said. Right. So... There's an evaporation protocol that we can imagine, which is say, if I want a black hole to evaporate in more or less, what I do is I increase or decrease K. So, you know, usually in anti desitter space, you just come to equilibrium with the radiation and you're done. So we're gonna kind of imagine putting kind of leaky boundary conditions here at the edge so that we can extract more or less uh, 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 radiation, you know, K quanta, and then kind of try to see what effect that has. Okay? Okay, yeah. Uh, and, and we're gonna try to 
it's the new black hole that's radiating and the radiation goes out of A. Is so it's this black hole, the original black hole, which was uh -huh. equilibrium with the radiation. Uh -huh. But imagine that that equilibrium with the radiation really meant that the, the black hole had microstates. The, uh -huh. micro, you know, the entanglement must be between the microstates somehow and the radiation, right? right. So, and I'm drawing the microstates as states of this internal brain and then putting a dual for that. I see. Okay. Okay, just, just keep asking questions if there's, if, if there's confusing things. Okay. Right at the end, the dual itself also became a black, an area space and a black hole. Okay, the reason is, so we took the, the theory on the end of the world brain to be a conformal field theory in its own right. Right, okay. So if it's a large end conformal field theory, it can have a dual in its own right. Okay. So, so right, so for example, imagine that I have an ADS space with some central charge, right, C. Now suppose in it, I put a large stack of ND brains. Then very close to those ND brains, you're going to have another ADS throat, whose mm -hmm. side is going to get controlled by the number of D brains you put there. Mm -hmm. so locally near those D brains, there is a different conformal field theory on those D brains, which is going to be dual to that local little local region. Right, okay. So it's a really perturbation of the local region around where you put the- Right, N except or because or it's gravity, the local region can have a huge volume. Okay. Okay. Fair right. And, right. And and, uh, and what happens to this local region as n goes to infinity or in the large n limit? Well, uh, we're going to take the large n limit. So everything is going to be big. So so this local region, I'm going to be able to think about as a complete anti-dissiter space in which this end of the world brain, this microstate brain, lives on one boundary of this anti-dissiter space. I see. So I'll draw a picture of that in a minute. It may help. Okay, so you. here's going to be the picture. So you, you see this black hole, right, in here. This, this sort of, this, the black hole of the black hole, you know, in some behind the, this is the black hole behind the horizon, <laughs> which is the dual to the, this end of the world brain, right? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this black hole, I'm gonna purify that by saying that this black hole is itself produced uh, uh, by entanglement with some auxiliary system. So we're going to take, so this was the end of the world brain. It was supposed to have an anti-dissiter space on this side, if you like, that had a, a black hole in it. Instead, I'm going to draw that, you know, I'm going to purify that by having a second asymptotic region there. Right, I'm going to basically turn it into a thermal field double. So in, in a natural way, this auxiliary system that purifies this inception black hole, basically this thing in here, that auxiliary system is naturally identified with the radiation we originally had. Remember that if you go back to the state we originally had, which is this thing, it's a pure state because the microstates entangled with the radiation. So if I purify the, 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 the dual black hole, the inception black hole behind the horizon, then the purification system is naturally identified with the radiation. So in some sense, this, this thing that you know, purifies the dual to the microstates behind the horizon should be identified with the radiation itself. So it's like this. So if you have this asymptotic region originally, then you have this horizon, then behind the horizon, you have this end of the world brain. Now we said that itself has a local dual, right? So that's some anti-dissiter space that contained a black hole. And I'm gonna treat that black hole as really being like a thermal field double state. And so there it is, it comes out here. So this is the radiation. So now what I've done is it's like taking the radiation which is originally sitting on the outside here, right? It was sitting here and it sort of folded back out over there. So it'll look like this. Wait, so the purification region has to be an exact copy of the original one? Or no. that is for the no. Victoria that it looks yeah, so It's not an exact copy of the original one at all necessarily because um, it's not necessarily an, uh, uh, an exact copy. It can have a different central charge. It can have a different Newton constant, right? You can arrange the parameters in whichever way gives the correct dual to the theory on this red brain over here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a little bit like a realization of this ER equals EPR idea, because you see the, the, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this brain here, the states on this end of the world brain are entangled with the radiation. So it's as if by doing this sort of process of you know, doing holography for these states here separately and then purifying that, we've built the bridge to the radiation that would have been over here. 
right? So it's, it's, a, it's a geometrization of the idea that the states in this brain are entangled with the radiation over there. Can I move on or further questions? Please move on, ask questions at the end because we don't have much time left. Yeah, I'm not going to get absolutely to the end of this talk, but that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll skip a couple of things. Okay, so we can do the same um, process in Euclidean signature. And the Euclidean version of this geometry is what would, you might call a folded cigar geometry. So a single black hole has this sort of cigar geometry in the Euclidean section. And so what's going on here is that you sort of chop it off there. That's the end of the world brain in Euclidean signature, the angular direction of Euclidean time, and you splice in another geometry. That's the geometry that's behind, if you like, that's dual to the end of the world brain that would have been sitting here. So I can sort of fold this back out. And you know, if I look from the top, if I look from the top of this, this is once one rim. And this is this thing here becomes this rim here. And this is where the end of the world brain would sit. This is the place where you splice them together. And uh, I'm not, if you have the time, I'm not going to go through the details. But you basically try to find a solution to the equations of motion that satisfies the Israel junction conditions and makes a continuous metric going through and such that the induced stress tensor in this brain is the holographic stress tensor for the other side. And so you have to find a solution of this kind. So now given this, you can now apply the standard Ryu Takanagi prescription for entanglement entropy in this total geometry. So what we're gonna say is that suppose you want to compute the entanglement entropy, let's say of this region here, you're allowed, for example, to have um, minimal surfaces that would go all the way in and maybe end in the brain if the brain had been there. But because there's no brain, they'll get refracted uh, in the absence of the brain, right? So rather than including the entanglement entropy of a segment of the brain, they can penetrate into this other holographic region on the other side in this manner, okay? Um, so they'll get refracted through. So the whole geometry, now that we've done holography for the microstates, we can allow the uh, minimal surfaces of Ryu and Takenagi to penetrate into the second holographic region. So, okay, and then uh, uh, the, the RT prescription would appear to say, if I have, let's say, this region here, then the entanglement entropy should be the minimum of all possible, uh, you know, extremal surfaces. That uh, we take the area of the surface over four G newton. Uh, G newton plus the entropy of the brain segment, and the entropy of the brain segment by the RT prescription for the, you know, uh, we can use holography for this brain segment and say that, well, that's given by the minimal surface within this inception geometry. So you, know, you first do this part for this region, and then you do this part for the end of the world brain. Okay. Uh, so this is then how the page transition happens. So suppose now, we agreed that this thing here was the radiation, right? So basically the thing that purifies the holographic dual of the end of the world brain is the radiation. So that's this thing here. So now what I wanna do is to compute the entanglement entropy of this entire radiation boundary. So if you do that, you're going to get, there are two possibilities, right? There are multiple different surfaces here. This is one, if you allow the minimal surfaces to pass through the system, then you can either get this thing or you can get this thing. And the page transition basically happens as follows. Early on, you get, uh, do I have a picture here? Yes, so here's how it happens. So basically, as you increase the, amount, the, uh, the number of uh, the entanglement temperatures, so the number of radiation uh, 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 bits that you have, the, initially, this thing here inside the inception geometry is the minimal surface that's homologous to this boundary R. And as you increase the amount of radiation, this thing becomes the entanglement surface, uh, becomes the minimal surface. So early in the evaporation protocol, the entanglement wedge of the radiation, which is this boundary here, only contains the inception geometry. So that's like saying that the, um, that uh, it doesn't, so this means it does not contain the interior of the black, of the, act, of the real black hole, which is this region. And late in the evaporation protocol, the entanglement wedge of the radiation does contain the black hole interior. So this is the thing that in the island formula would be called the island. The island. Another way of saying this is that this 
part of the calculation is like the holographic representation of the idea that when you compute the entanglement entropy of the radiation, well, what do you do? You compute the entanglement entropy of the radiation because this thing has all been, we've done holography for the radiation and its entanglement with the end of the world brain. Uh, that's just computed by computing this minimal surface. But when you get past a certain amount of, of, of entanglement, the, uh, this interior of the actual black hole becomes a thing whose uh, you know, surface area you have to add in your computation of the entanglement entropy of the radiation. So that, that's this sort of island that's disconnected from the asymptotic part of the real space that, uh, 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 that, that appears in the island formula. So do people follow that? The silence could mean either yes or no. Yes, yes. Okay, great. So, um, so in view of the time, you know what? Uh, I'm, uh, okay, let me tell you how this gets proved by the replica trick. And then I think I want to move on to give you at least a flavor of the next section of the talk, and then we'll stop. So you can prove this. So, so I, I proved this formula by doing sort of holography for holography, but, um, but you can actually do this by the replica trick. So the way you do that using the replica trick is that this is the Euclidean geometry. And if you want to compute the entanglement entropy of the theory on this boundary, what you do is you cut it open. And then after you've cut it open, you compute, uh, if you do the path integral on this, you will get the uh, density matrix uh, uh, associated with this cut. Then for, this is for the experts in the audience who know how to do this kind of calculation. Then you have to glue this cyclically to compute the trace of, you know, let's say the Renyi entropy. So this is trace rho cubed. And then you fill in this boundary for the system with a replica symmetric bulk saddle. So this is going too fast for anybody but the experts to follow this. So, and it turns out that there are two ways to fill in such a boundary. So if you take this boundary, which, uh, whoops, where is this? If you take this boundary, you know, with cuts here, 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 then it'll, and here's one way to fill it in, right? With this, with this bulk geometry, with this bulk Euclidean geometry, there are actually two ways to fill it in. One, where the fixed point is in the inception side of the geometry, namely, it's in this part of the geometry. And there is uh, another one where the fixed point is on the real black hole side. And you can show that these two kinds of replicas, you know, exchange dominance. And uh, by exchanging dominance, they take you from the two sides of the page transition and give you back the sort of uh, unitary looking uh, page curve. Okay, so that would have gone by too fast, but I just want to justify that there is a, a replica trick way of doing things. Okay, so, um, I had, uh, so, so here's what I propose to do. So there were a bunch more results that we have of, about the setting, which once you have the setting, you can use it to dig out more details about how information is organized in the Hawking radiation. And you can show that in the setting, the Hawking radiation implements what's called a secret sharing scheme, wherein if I take, let's say I split the radiation into two parts, R1, R2, and I take any one part, R1 or R2, separately. If I take the information I can gather from R1, the information I can gather from R2, then you cannot, uh, no matter how much you gather, you can't reconstruct the microstates in the interior of the black hole. But if you gather them together, then you can reconstruct the interior. You can show that. And that's basically a kind of secret sharing scheme where you have a bunch of different parties here understood to be all the different pieces of the radiation. And they have to sort of work together because there's shared information between them that's necessary for encoding the interior. So that's another thing that appears in our paper, but I'm not going to discuss it because I want to talk about something else. Okay, so anyway, the outcome is that uh, you seem to get back unitarity, semi-classical gravity, uh, uh, at least in the page curve, by uh, just using the RT formula with this extension of allowing holography for the microstates and then allowing RT surfaces, uh, minimal surfaces to pass through, uh, pass through into this new holographic region. Uh, there's a further interesting thing that we didn't have time to discuss, that the radiation seems to implement a quantum secret sharing scheme, that you need simultaneous quantum access to all of it to recover the black hole interior. So that's part of, you remember earlier, uh, I was saying that using this sort of microscopic reasoning with microstates and this, that, and the other, one can show that, you know, if you compute any endpoint correlation function, it's just not going to be enough to recover the interior unless you have extreme uh, precision or exponential precision. So this is a little bit like that. So uh, uh, that if I take any subset of the radiation and make measurements in it, then you can't actually recover the entire interior. You need all of it at the same time uh, because there's this quantum secret sharing scheme. So this, this, uh, these computations also seem to suggest that. 
So I have uh, 10 minutes. Is that right, Santan? Uh, you have uh, perfectly 12 minutes. <laughs> 12 minutes. Okay. So um, in that case, I think what I would like to do in the remaining 12 minutes is to give you a flavor of, uh, uh, of two more things that come out here. So one is, um, you know, this was pretty complicated, this, all of this discussion with inception and you know, holography for holography. So it's actually useful to have a more simplified setting where you can think about where these entanglement islands come from. Uh, because I suspect that the previous discussion might have been a bit confusing, although I recommend going to read the paper, which I think uh, will clarify things. So, um, so I'm going to give you a simple example, right, that will hopefully clarify what's going on. So the entanglement island formula was derived originally in two dimensions by applying a replica method for computing entanglement entropy. And there's a whole bunch of you know, technical difficulties because you've got to splice a gravitating region to a non-gravitating region. You just saw in the discussion that I just gave the sort of the, the verbal wriggles I had to go through, you know, put the radiation just outside and do inception for these or, you know, holography for the microstates and then somehow connect the radiation to that. So there was a lot of wriggling going back and forth, which is kind of mentally kind of confusing. So let's just back this out and come back to try to divide the simplest scenario where we can see what's going on. So the cleanest possible scenario where we could see what this supposed effect of semi-classical gravity is, is to think about two entangled, two-dimensional, and disjoint universes A and B. So I have universe A and universe B. Universe B is going to have gravity on it, and both universe A and universe B have you know, effective field theories on it. So there's gravity, but I don't have to deal with these two things interacting or radiating into each other or any such nonsense, nothing dynamical. It's just completely static. But I have decided that I have two Hilbert space A and B disjoint in two separate universes. And I have, you know, I can write down the effective actions log of the ZA is the log of the field theory effective action A and log ZB consists of two pieces. There's the semi-classical gravity, which has been causing us headaches all along. And then there's the um, effective action of a CFD. So as simple as possible in the interactions. So now what I can do is really distill down to the sort of basics here is we can think about an entangled state of these two universes. So I have IA, I are the states of universe A, the non-gravitating universe, and psi I are the states of universe B, this is the gravitating universe. And you know, I construct some uh, pure state, the weights are root P, where this looks like a thermal field, you know, like a thermal state, but I'm gonna weight this with an entanglement temperature beta, and EI are the energies in the gravitating universe B, which can include contributions from a conformal anomaly. So I'm gonna set this up. So universe B is going to be the tricky one because it has gravity in it. So we're gonna set it up in, again, the simplest possible way to consist of some conformal field theory sitting on it, right? This is some two dimensional thing with a conformal field theory on it. And we're going to do everything Euclidean plus JT gravity. So for those of you who know JT gravity, you'll be familiar with the setup. You know, there's the deloton, there's the Ricci scalar in the bulk and some extrinsic curvatures floating around. Okay, so our goal to mimic uh, the discussion that I just gave and that, in, that the island formula is involved is to compute the entanglement entropy of the non-gravitating universe A. So what do I do to do that? Well, you know, I'm supposed to, first of all, take psi psi, take the density matrix for the whole pure state for the whole system. I'm supposed to trace out the universe B, the gravitating universe that gives me rho A, the density matrix of universe A. I need to compute the von Neumann entropy, which is minus trace rho log rho of universe A. And I can use the uh, replica method to do that, which is I take the limit as n goes to one of the DDN of rho, trace of rho A to the n. So that's, that's the calculation I want to do. And I can't imagine a simpler setting than this disjoint universe setting to do it. What do I have to do to compute this? Well, you know, I have to compute trace rho A to the n. So it's this, if, I, if you just work out what the state was and just multiply things out, it's these probabilities PI multiplied together times a product of these overlaps between the states in the gravitating universe. This is what I have to compute. So then how do I compute these overlaps? Well, to compute these overlaps, well, these things are all closed universes like spheres. Well, uh, uh, well, suppose I want to prepare the state psi j. Well, I take the sphere, um, I'll, I'll look at the state on the equator. And to do that, I insert, it's conformal field theory. So I insert an operator on the, well, on the north or the south pole, depending upon whether I want the bra or the cat. And that path integral then with the states, with the operators inserted on the north and south pole computes this overlap. So completely standard calculation in a conformal field theory, right? Uh, where the, on some sphere with some metric. 
So, okay, so you can do this. So if you were told to do this kind of calculation, this kind of uh, this, this calculation of this, of this correlation function, these kinds of correlation functions uh, uh, um, in the standard approach to the replica trick, here's what you would do. You would say that here is the non-gravitating universe A, here's a cut, this is the region on which I want to compute the entanglement entropy. So what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to compute rho A to the N, right? Rho A to the N means to compute the path integral. I take N copies of A and B, A and B, A and B. Universe B just goes along for the ride and I have a cut here and a cut here and I you know, uh, splice together these two copies. This is for the second Renier entropy along this cut. Why do I splice along that cut? Because I want the path integral to compute the density matrix squared. So then, you know, I have two copies of the universe spliced together according to the standard rules of path integrals. So this is what I should do. So the new proposal says that if you are going to have part of the system, this universe B that has gravity, then you should also consider including these kinds of wormholes between the gravitational replicas, even though there is no entanglement cut there. So that's the basic proposal. So in this case, life is much easier than the usual settings because we're in two dimensions and because there's no interaction between these. It's just been as simple as possible. So the question is, these were the standard path integrals I would do to compute the Renyi entropy. This is the second Renyi entropy. But now I'm asked to also consider including these saddle points. So what are the steps? First, you pick the topology and geometry of the replica, geom of the, uh, of the replica uh, um, geometry, right? So it could be this, it could be this, et cetera. Then, I have to compute these kinds of CFT correlators right, on, on them because that's the, that's the overlap calculation I need to do. Then I need to compute the conformal field theory stress tensor on B after tracing over A and find the back reactor geometry and then use that to evaluate the on-shell action of JT gravity. The reason is I'm going to compute the contribution uh, uh, to the semi-classical path integral by putting this, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, to compute the semi-classical contribution uh, to the path integral of B, uh, you need to do this thing where you compute the, uh, well, you, you back react the stress tensor onto B and then you compute the action. Fine, so these are the, uh, the, the just three steps, uh, completely straightforward. And there's an outcome. So the outcome turns out to be that there are two kinds of replica symmetric saddles that can, that can dominate the calculation. One is the fully disconnected one, no wormholes. This is the original thing everybody always did to compute entanglement entropy. And then there's the fully connected saddles like this, right? fully connected um, uh, wormhole, uh, you know, wormholes in all the gravitating regions. And that's also, there's a replica symmetric saddle like that. And these two exchange dominance at low and high entanglement temperatures. So this is what you get. So at low entanglement, so this is an, a picture of the fully connected saddle here. So at low entanglement temperatures, it turns out that the entanglement entropy of the non-gravitating universe A is equal to the entanglement entropy of the non-gravitating universe B. It's the thermal entropy because we construct a thermal state. And these two are equal because we're in a pure state. So, you know, and this is the partition of the system into two pieces. Great, so that's the, uh, you just, uh, that's like saying, I take the radiation and I compute its entanglement entropy and that's what I get. But at high entanglement temperatures, it turns out that the entanglement entropy of A equals the field theory entropy on a union of A plus an island on the gravitating region B, I'm going to call that C, C in B, plus the surface area of C. In other words, the formula that looks like this. So, so because it's the sum, and because A union B is in a pure state, you can rewrite this in terms of the complement of C. So here's the answer then for the entanglement entropy of A. It's the minimum, of the entanglement entropy on the gravitating region B, or equivalent in the gravitating on the region A, or the minimum of the entanglement entropy of an island in the region in, in the gravitating region B plus its surface area. Right? So it's extremely clean and just a straight statement that if you do the Euclidean path integral for gravity, allowing wormholes, you will get the conclusion that if the gravitating region is entangled with some, you know, even a disjoint set of quanta, uh, you know, radiation elsewhere, or a different universe, you will find that the entanglement entropy of the universe, of the other universe, is partly controlled by the area of a little island sitting somewhere in the gravitating region. Completely amazing, right? And um, so, yeah, you know, you can use this in many ways. You can use this, for example, to study entanglement between disitter universes containing black holes. And with Arjun Kar and Tomonori Ugajin, uh, we are in the process of doing this. So I think the basic lesson here is that somehow 
the Euclidean gravitational path integral with the wormholes knows something about the microstates that are actually there in the system. And it's really unclear why and how, right? So there's a, sat a Euclidean saddle point that seems to sum over, in some sense, many of the actual microstates, the Lorentzian microstates that are there. And I think that's a question that we will have to continue to investigate and understand. So I'm actually out of time. So I'm gonna stop now and I'm not gonna tell you about the last thing, which was about uh, these, uh, uh, about these Euclidean wormholes also implying in some circumstances that the dual is actually an ensemble. So anyway, let me summarize. So the question we went after today was uh, some sort of cross between a summer school lecture and an actual research seminar on the question of is quantum gravity unitary? So what I told you was that at least for some black holes, we know the microstates explicitly. So that's a step towards understanding unitarity. Information about these microstates is available at infinity, but it's hard to measure. You can show that explicitly. So that seems to explain the information problem. And uh, in, AD, oops, in ADS CFT, um, the, uh, you, know, you already know that quantum gravity must be unitary because it's dual to unitary quantum field theory. But what we now know is without knowing even the details of the microstates, it appears that the page curve, at least, for the entanglement of Hawking radiation can be reproduced in purely in semi-classical gravity by including the sort of islands in the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. And that this formula can be derived using the replica trick if you allow Euclidean, uh, uh, you know, basically gravitating space-time wormholes in the Euclidean path integral. And so the question I'd like to leave you with is how does the Euclidean path integral know about the microstates? Because in the end, if the thing is unitary, that means there's a bunch of microstates and the microstate and, the, and you know something about them. Somehow the Euclidean path integral is summing over them or knows about them or knows enough about them for store unitarity. And that's something that we would really like to understand. Great, I will stop there. Yeah, it's a excellent talk and uh, I'm very happy that you, <laughs> you have managed to cover the whole thing together. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. And uh, you guys can ask a question now because, uh, but it shouldn't be straight so long because uh, you guys have already asked many questions and he already spoke about already two hours. So I don't want to put him uh, like, so you guys can ask, but it has to be short questions, not very long. So I would like to understand this uh, uh, island picture a little better, but if somebody else has questions, they should go first because I... Yeah, please, other mm -hmm. people ask and then you ask. Mm -hmm. If somebody have questions, please ask. No questions. Okay, then you ask. Okay, so can we, I should have noted down the slide number, but there, there's a slide uh, where you had connected the two, uh, well, you had this uh, new thing added and the, um, the island uh, was showing up in green color. Uh, be, uh, further back, uh, this one. So this island should be, I mean, so you said the island appears once the, I would just say the length, whereas it should be some other word, but the, uh, or the area of the minimal uh, surface blue increases uh, or becomes more than the area of the minimal, the black minimal surface. That's so right. This is, this is literally some kind of a phase transition going on in your system. Yes. It's a very discontinuous process. It just uh, happens precisely at yes. this point. So this is, uh, you remember in uh, when there's the holographic mutual information transition, um, mm -hmm. there's this uh, situation where uh, below some, you know, if you take two intervals uh, in a conformal field theory and you keep them apart, they don't share any mutual information. And then you come across some critical distance separation relative to their size. And all of a sudden there's mutual information, at least in the large end limit where these things are connected with uh, a classical gravity. So that's a, that's a transition, but there's a transition here. So one way of thinking about this, um, if I might draw a picture is uh, forget about this left, re uh, you know, forget this region, right? So said, the real system, the real system, if I don't do this whole hol holography trick for the, for the microstates starts here at A and ends at this end of the world brain. And what we're dry, really talking about is this picture is supposed to depict what is the entanglement wedge of the radiation. That is to say, 
what region, what, what part of the system can be reconstructed by knowledge of, of by, by quantum knowledge of everything in this radiation. So when there's a small amount of entanglement, you reconstruct this thing. So which means that you know something about the microstate, right? Uh, uh, but you don't actually reconstruct uh, the uh, data in this region are not part of the entangled wedge of the radiation, right? So you, again, you should not, uh, you should act as if you're not seeing this. It's sort of just, uh, there's a sort of, uh, this wormhole, um, if you like, is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's going outside, it's outside the space. Mm -hmm. But then you get to the critical, uh, stage where uh, this blue horizon, if you like, is bigger than this black horizon, and then the entire black hole interior then is part of this entangled wedge, which means indeed suddenly this island here is uh, this disconnected piece of the bulk becomes part of what is stored in the entanglement thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, let, me note, let me note that in some of the work uh, by um, the others, like um, like the paper by Anheri, Shigulia, and others, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Malasena, um, uh, and, and so on. You know, they what they do is they uh, they consider the radiation, and they uh, in their case, what they do is they have a two dimensional system, and then the radiation is in two dimensions, and then they do holography for the radiation, and then uh, basically they, they they add a third dimension to everything. So the whole of the entire field theory and the entire two-dimensional world gets a holographic dual, and then they try to, and then they get sort of pictures where uh, the holography in this extra dimension that you imagine um, uh, implies the presence of these kinds of entanglement wedges and islands. So here, one of the virtues of this three-dimensional setting is uh, is everything is in three dimensions. So basically, you start out in three dimensions. This end of the world brain is some, you know. Is, it, uh, is some two-dimensional system. So its holographic dual is also three-dimensional. So it's as if you can start with the BTZ, if you like, and then continue all in three dimensions. So although I didn't show it to you, all these calculations can be done very explicitly by sort of splicing geometries in three dimensions. So that's the, uh, but, but morally, there's a similarity with what happens in, the, uh, in, in that setting where they start with the two-dimensional JT gravity coupled to matter, and then they, Add a third dimension as the conformal as the dual description of the conformal field theory that's coupled to the JT gravity. Oh, yeah, no, so that's the. I mean, the. Uh, so there's a paper by Moaz and uh, Maldesena where they discuss Euclidean uh, ADS three wormholes. Yes, and they're very explicit models uh, in terms of uh, hyperbolic three spaces. Yes. Or the things that you're doing, it seems that one should be able to do them literally in the in that setting of uh, three manifolds. Yes. So uh, those things are slightly different from these ones, uh, uh, because uh, here, you know, we have this end of the world brain, and what you have here is a is a long wormhole of a certain kind, and there's a splicing condition, and and, <laughs> and the cosmological constant can be different across the boundary, etc. But the Maos Maldesen and wormholes are very interesting to think about because one of the reasons they're very interesting to think about is in fact that was the inspiration for one of the inspirations for uh, this uh, second part that I didn't talk about um, and that uh, what's going on there is uh, you know you have two conformal field theories and normally you would think that if I compute let's say the partition sum of two conformal field theories that are disconnected have nothing to do with each other etc 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 the partition sum of these two conformal field theories should be well the product of their partition sum so the identical conformal field theories it should be the square but the existence of these Maos Maldesena wormholes, uh, these are space time wormholes, right, tells you that the partition sum of these two theories will not factorize. Mm -hmm. And that tells you that you have some kind of strange issue with interpreting. Oh, well, okay, let me back up. So let's suppose that the prescription in ADS CFT for computing the partition sum of a field theory is you compute the bulk path integral with whatever boundary conditions you want, right? That's the ADS CFT prescription. Mm -hmm. So if I've got two conformal field theories, the ADS CFT prescription is supposed to be, I fill in a bulk that meets these boundaries and that gives me the partition sum, right? For this product of two theories. So if I expect these two theories to be completely separate, then in order to get a factorizing partition sum, you know, you should get, you know, disconnected geometries. Right, so the bulk path integral should, you know, there's one geometry attached to this boundary, and one uh, uh, geometry attached to this boundary. You do the partitions, you do the bulk path integral, you get something that factorizes. But if you have wormholes that connect the two, uh, the two boundaries, if such a thing exists, if there's a saddle point to the gravity that connects these boundaries, then you will find a non-factorizing path integral. 
in meaning you won't factorize with respect to the data of the two boundaries, which then tells you that there's something uh, there's something wrong, perhaps, with the interpretation that the bulk path integral computed this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, partition sum and two disconnected theories. Right. So you could scratch your head and wonder how to fix that. And one way of fixing that appears to be to think that actually there's an ensemble of theories in the dual. So personally, I find that very confusing. Because you know, on the one, if there's an actual if quantum gravity, you could in quantum gravity with uh, with wormholes or space-time wormholes, uh, you know, uh, is dual to an ensemble of theories. Then then that doesn't sound unitary. But we just showed that by including such wormholes, you could restore unitarity in the page curve. So I actually think that there's a tension between these two very interesting developments that's going on. I see. And I think the Maos Malacena wormholes are a a case in point. For the existence of such geometries, of such of such contributions to the path integral. Okay, cool. So okay, um, how? I mean, if you can just say very quickly, how does one show that the partition where the uh, the partition function of the two theories doesn't factorize, or the sum of the two things doesn't factorize? So it should depend on uh, the geometry of the wormhole somehow. Yeah. It, it, it should, yes, absolutely. So, Matt, so the question is, what kind of uh, wormholes do you have? And you have to evaluate that. And so from the contribution of that. So, so maybe I'll just show you two pictures, you know. So the kind of uh, picture, what is a Euclidean, what are these kinds of wormholes we're talking about? You know, you imagine that time is running up here, right? Here's one boundary, Euclidean boundary, here's another Euclidean boundary. Um, this is a space-time wormhole then where uh, you can add stuff like this. And then if you take horizontal slices, this can make you know, baby universes. So Euclidean wormholes are you know, things that connect different boundaries. Uh, you know, if you sum over all possible Euclidean wormholes, you're like summing over baby universes, namely processes where you, you know, split off a universe, you bring it back in, things like this. And can this sum be made sense of, um, I mean, the usual gravity sense that it's a sum over all the possible geometries? That correct. Are yeah, the case of the Mahas, uh, Maldesena thing, you know, that is one possible geometry. There's another geometry clearly where it each boundary separately and just fill it in, right? With a, yeah. with a, with just a, with a standard ADS on it. Right, you just make it solid basically, yeah. Right, so you can make it separate or you can make it connect. So the, I'm just giving an example here of summing over all possible topologies with a given Absolutely. boundary. There's a huge moduli space of these things. That's the... Yes, so, so very hard to do that sum. So in general, it's very difficult to do. So, uh, you know, um, as you know, there's some uh, recent work by Maralf and Maxfield, where what they tried to do is they tried to reduce the complexity of that by studying a topological theory, where you just weight things by their genus and then sum over all possible genuses. So, and you can extend that, it turns out, by sort of including other kinds of data like spin structures. And, uh, you know, so you basically include fermions, except for topological kind of, Fermion data, which is the spin structure, you know, periodic versus anti-periodic boundary conditions, and you can see that then that changes the sum, right? Over uh, there's a huge space of such things you can sum over. So you sum over all of them, and then you ask, here's this object: Can I interpret this as the partition sum or a product of partition sums in some dual theory? And it turns out that if you want to do that, you need to have an ensemble. Okay. There's a recently some talks by Maloney about his work with uh, Witten where they're summing over precisely these uh, handle bodies that you just mentioned. Uh huh. Yeah. I haven't. I haven't. I haven't. Uh, I saw their paper, but I haven't had uh, unfortunately the time to read it yet, and I haven't listened to Alex's talk. I should do that. Um, um, are, uh, let me see. Are they? Uh, they. You know, they have had this long-term program to try to get a dual to pure gravity in three dimensions mm -hmm. and uh, are they are they getting a dual to pure gravity there or uh, i think they come to the same conclusion as yours that it's a uh, average over an ensemble uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. and uh, something funny uh, yeah there's something there's something uh there's some, i think there's an un, personally i think there's an unresolved tension here uh we have lots and lots of evidence in many many cases in ads cft that you take a unitary conformal field theory, you compute its correlation functions, and you know there's a prescription in ADS-CFT for how to calculate that, and you get the answer. So, but now we have, but you know, I, I usually think of the path integral as really being defined in Euclidean signature, and then we analytically continue to get whatever we want. And so now we have several results 
you know, several different settings where uh, you do the Euclidean path integral, you do follow what would seem like a completely reasonable rule. You set the boundary conditions and you have some overall topology satisfying the boundary condition that seems entirely reasonable. Mm -hmm. And then you get these other ones, things that look as though they need an ensemble in the dual. So I'm not yet completely, and, and to me an ensemble in that sense, uh, you know, it's a statistical description. It's not a unitary, it's not a unitary description. So one connection that maybe I'll mention, um, uh, which also I don't completely know what to make of, is um, this This is a paper I wrote many years ago with uh, Esko Keske Bakuri and Nico Yokela. Um, and uh, uh, so in this paper, we were considering um, uh, so the universes that kind of have a beginning in time. So you imagine that you have one of these unstable D brains that Ashok Sen had been talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have an unstable D brain that you sort of basically place at the beginning of time. And the universe develops from there. So this was a, an attempt to try to get a kind of a, a whole, uh, uh, use D brains to get a holographic description for a time dependent space. Okay, so you have this beginning of space where you have this unstable D brain which decays away and then sort of produces the macroscopic space. So you can show that if you wish to calculate, you know, I don't know, correlation functions and of different kinds, that that thing, when you try to compute it, can be equivalently, so you can do this in string, uh, in worksheet string theory, and you, know, you can use the D-brain techniques to calculate this. This, it's equal, the quantities you compute, the correlation functions, are equal to computations in an ensemble of matrix models of different rank. So in that mm -hmm. case, Basically, you have a Euclidean theory placed at the beginning of time because the beginning of time is Euclidean surface. You place an ensemble of theories of different rank, of matrix, matrix theories of different rank. Therefore, with Hilbert space of different dimension, just like you know, in these recent developments. Uh, so for example, this example here, one of the things in the ensemble is the dimension of the Hilbert space. You consider an ensemble of theories with dimension, Hilbert space dimensions of different size. In that example, there's an uh, ensemble of matrix models of different dimension. And then you compute um, you know, you, you compute quantities in that ensemble, and that seems to give you uh, an answer for the you know correlation functions in this uh, time evolving space. So I also so that's another sort of place. That's the first place I saw the appearance of an ensemble of this kind. Um, uh, uh, and so I I. Uh, and then, of course, we saw the appearance of ensembles in the SYK model, where there's an ensemble of couplings. So I am, um, I'm not personally yet completely sure what to make of these things. Are we supposed to find a way to sort of, you know, uh, arm twist them into being unitary descriptions of, uh, you know, a unitary theory describing unitary space? Are we supposed to embrace the idea that there's actually an ensemble of theories, so somehow inherently uh, things are statistical in this way. I, 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 don't, I, I don't yet, I, I'm not sure I yet know, but it's very exciting that the option exists to think about this. <laughs> right, and there are techniques, there are techniques to think about this. Yeah. It's practical, that's the... Uh, thank you for giving uh, your time. So I would ask, I, I have seen that a lot of people are not here, but at least those who are here. So give a clap for him for giving such a nice talk. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, I will share the uh, YouTube link soon uh, with Vijay. Uh, yeah, you, I will send you the link. Just what one thing, uh, slides will be available somewhere? No, Please? slides I am not allowing. Ah, okay. The, you can uh, see the whole video there. You can actually follow everything. Okay, okay. but uh, for some reason, I'm not allowing the slides. Sure, okay. Okay. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. much. Yeah, so I will write about uh, something, uh, uh, yeah, about your work and uh, related to some thing I'm thinking about at present. But yeah, some issues. I have actually pointed in uh, email uh, uh, that I will uh, write to you again, maybe. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And thank you. See you. See you. Bye. Yeah. And be safe and healthy. That's yeah. important. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> okay. Bye.